Do you wanna learn blockchain programming? Cause today I'm gonna to show you how to write your first blockchain application powered by Ethereum, Web3, and Solidity smart contracts. And you don't have to know anything about blockchain in order to follow along. I'm gonna teach you from scratch. I've even created a step-by-step -step guide with written instructions and code examples, and you can find a link to that down in the description below. So if you're new around here, I'm Gregory from DAP University, and I've helped tens of thousands of people learn blockchain programming, and I wanna help you today. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and click the like button down below. And if you wanna learn how you can become a highly paid blockchain developer, you can join my free training on my website over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp and I'll also put a link to that down in the description below. So today, I'm gonna to teach you blockchain programming from square one by building a complete blockchain application. We'll create Ethereum smart contracts with the Solidity programming language. We'll write tests for these smart contracts in JavaScript. We'll deploy the smart contracts to a blockchain, and we'll create a client-side website with Web3.js and React.js so that users can actually interact with the smart contract on the blockchain. And don't worry if you don't know these programming languages already, I'm gonna teach them to you as we go. So let's go ahead and look at the application that we're gonna build. This is a marketplace application that runs on the blockchain, kind of like Craigslist. It allows people to list items for sale and it allows other people to purchase those items with cryptocurrency. Whenever somebody purchases the item, they instantly become the owner. That's because the application is powered by a smart contract on the blockchain, which manages the marketplace. It tracks who owns the item for sale and it transfers the ownership of it automatically anytime someone purchases the item with cryptocurrency. So it kind of works like a vending machine. So let me break that down if any of that's confusing. Let's start with the basics. So like, what is a blockchain? So a blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes that all talk to one another, right? These nodes are basically just computers that share responsibilities very similar to a web server. They store data and run programs that can be accessed anywhere whenever you're connected to the blockchain. And all the nodes work together to create a public network that anyone can connect to. So you can think about a blockchain in a few ways. One way is to think about it like a really giant world computer where all the computers work together. You can also think about it like a network where you can send money and run programs. And you can also think about it like a database that you can store information inside of and, you know, fetch it back out. So the blockchain, you know, assumes a lot of the responsibilities that a single web server would normally, you know, assume, like keeping the application code on a web server and also keeping the data on another web server. But the blockchain actually delegates this responsibility across all the nodes in the network. So instead of keeping all the code and the data to an application on a web server, the blockchain you know, distributes this to all the different nodes. So that means that you know, each of these nodes in this you know, gets a copy of the code and the data on the blockchain, right? And they all work together to you know, run the code and make sure that the data doesn't change and is secure. That's why it's run on the blockchain. So all the data on the blockchain is contained in bundles of records called blocks, which are chained together to make up the public ledger. And all the nodes on the network work together to make sure that this data is secure and unchanged. And that's what makes the blockchain so powerful. So how would you connect to a blockchain? Well, in order to do it, you need access to a single node, right? You either run your own node or connect to one. And whenever you do, you have access to the power of the entire network. So what is a smart contract? Smart contracts are the building blocks that we use to create blockchain applications. They're programs that we can write to run on the blockchain. They're written in a programming language called Solidity, which I'm gonna teach you in this tutorial. They're immutable, which means they can't change. And we want that to be the case because we don't want the code to change at all. We wanna to deploy to the blockchain and know it's a contract that it's always gonna work the same way every time and that no one else can tamper with it. And it's also kind of like a microservice on the web. You can think about it like that. Right? It exists on the blockchain and really anyone can talk to it and read and write information from it and execute the business logic contained inside the program. So how does a smart contract work? Well, let's look at the diagram of the smart contract we're gonna build today. We're gonna write a smart contract to power the marketplace in this tutorial. And it's gonna work kind of like a vending machine. So we'll allow someone to list an item in our marketplace. And anytime someone wants to buy it, they're gonna send cryptocurrency, right? And the smart contract is gonna be in charge of sending the payment to the seller and then sending the item to the buyer. And so that's how you know, the smart contract is going to work. But what about the entire application? Like how does it all fit together? Well, let's look at the structure of a normal web application in order to understand that. And then we'll look at how our blockchain application is going to work. So here's the structure of a normal web application, right? You've got a client side uh, application running HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? That's accessed by a web browser, right? That's gonna go here. 
And this HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is going to be the front end, and it's going to talk to uh, you know a back end of some kind, a web server that's going to have all the application code, and then that's going to talk to a database that you know uh, contains all the data for the project, and all that's going to lie on a central server, right, right, right here. But this blockchain app is going to work differently. First, the user is going to connect to a web page with their browser, and then that web page is going to talk to the blockchain directly, right? It's going to connect to an Ethereum node that's gonna access all the data on the blockchain. And it's also gonna interact with the code that we write this smart contract, right? So the blockchain is basically gonna be our entire backend, right? Our front end is gonna be a website and the back end is gonna be you know, a smart contract running on the blockchain. All right, now that we've covered the basics, let's go ahead and get set up so we can start building our application. Before you get started, you need to make sure you have Node.js already installed in your computer. You can see if you have Node installed by going to your terminal and typing node-v. You can install Node with a package manager like Homebrew, or you can download it directly from the Node.js website. The first item in the blockchain developer toolkit is a personal blockchain. We're going to use Ganache as our personal blockchain for this tutorial. You can head over to truffleframework.com forward slash Ganache to download it. You can click this download link. And whenever you've downloaded it, make sure you install it. And when you open it, you've got a local blockchain running. So what is Ganache? You know, what is a personal blockchain? Well, a personal blockchain is like a real blockchain network, you know, that's connected to the public or anyone can connect to it, but it runs on a computer. It's, you know, a closed network. And Ganache basically, you know, is a process that runs on a computer that spins up this blockchain and runs on a server. So we can use this to develop smart contracts. We can run tests against it. We can run scripts against the network, develop applications that actually talk to this blockchain. And it's really helpful and it's an invaluable tool in the blockchain developer toolkit. So um, if you open Ganache, you know, you'll see you know, 10 accounts listed here. These are the addresses to each account on the side. And you'll see you know, these balances. You'll see 100 Ether. And this is the Ethereum cryptocurrency that each account has and is you know, required to you know, pay gas fees in the network and stuff like that. All right, so that's an overview of uh, the Ganache personal blockchain network. And we're going to leave Ganache here set up in our project because we're going to need it uh, running in order to develop our project the next dependency is the Truffle Framework. We're going to use the Truffle Framework to develop Ethereum smart contracts with the Solidity programming language. You can install Truffle by going to your terminal and typing npm install g truffle at 5.0.5. .5. And it's important that you use that exact version in order to follow along with this tutorial. So Truffle is a suite of tools that allows us to you know, develop smart contracts, write tests against smart contracts, deploy smart contracts to the blockchain. It gives us development console, and it also allows us to develop client-side applications inside of our project. So it does a lot, and I'm going to show off all those features in this tutorial. The next dependency is the MetaMask extension for Google Chrome. Remember that the Ethereum blockchain is a network, and we need a special browser extension in order to connect to that network. And that's where MetaMask comes into play. MetaMask will allow us to connect to the blockchain with our personal account and actually interact with the smart contract that we'll develop in this tutorial. You can install MetaMask by going to the Google Chrome Web Store and searching for MetaMask and clicking Install. And once you've installed it, just make sure that you enable it inside of your Chrome extensions like this. You can also see the little fox icon in your Extensions tab. All right, so the first thing we want to do is just set the project up. We want to make sure that our environment's configured properly, that we can talk to the blockchain and start coding without any problems, okay? So instead of, you know, creating a bunch of files ourselves, I want to get started with uh, a starter kit, okay? And this is something I created to allow you to create dApps quickly or blockchain applications without having to write a bunch of code yourself, right? I don't want you to have to do a ton of configuration. Um, so basically, you can just copy this URL. This is github.com forward slash dApp university forward slash starter kit and clone the project this way, all right? So if you're not very comfortable with Git, uh, you can also just download a zip file if you want to right here, but I'm going to use Git, okay? So I'm going to go to the terminal. And I'm going to say git clone. I'm going to paste in the URL. And I'm also going to provide the project name that I want to create. So in this case, it's going to be marketplace. Say marketplace. All right. Okay. So now I can change directory cd marketplace. All right. All right. And there we go. That's our new project. So I just cloned the starter kit and created a new folder called marketplace. And that's where we are. So I can see all the files inside of here. 
And I can see, um, you know, that there's Git information here. It comes with an initial commit, but that just uh, sets the project up, so that's okay. So I'll clear all this out. Now I'm going to uh, open this in my text editor, okay, to take a tour of the project. I'm going to use Sublime Text, um, and I can open files in projects with Sublime Text with this special sim link. Uh, say subble dot. If you don't have that, you know, configured on your computer, that's okay. You can just manually open the project in Sublime Text yourself. But that's how I do it. All right, so let's take a look at, you know, what we created uh, whenever we downloaded that uh, starter kit. Okay, so this is a truffle project. All right, you could have created something very similar to this with the truffle init command. But I've set this up, um, you know, with some dependencies already. We've got a bunch of JavaScript dependencies in here inside this package.json file uh, that we can use for testing, that we can use to just navigate our project really quickly. We've already got React installed, which is what we'll use to build the client-side application. Uh, we've got Bootstrap and installed so that we uh, don't have to write a bunch of CSS ourselves and can create really nice looking front ends. So this is designed for you to start creating full stack blockchain applications really quickly, right? And I've also got uh, the network configuration ready to go. We're already talking to uh, Ganache, our local blockchain, without any configuration. And you'll also see that I have some additional configuration here to put the smart contracts in a different place than they normally are in a Truffle project. And uh, there's several reasons I do that, but basically I'm going to keep all of our source code inside of this source code directory. So long story short, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, other Truffle projects, just know that the smart contracts are going to be uh, in a different location than they normally are, but that's not a really huge deal. It just uh, helps keep things a little more organized, especially for deployments. Okay. So um, we can take a look, uh, you know, inside the source directory, we're going to have our React components that we'll use to build the client side, but we'll also have the smart contracts, which will essentially be the back end for this project. All right. So inside the smart contracts directory is where we're going to create our first smart contract. We can already see that there is a smart contract inside of here. Um, this is actually just a smart contract that ships with uh, Truffle projects. This is a, a contract that handles migrations. So whenever you put new smart contracts on the blockchain, Truffle uses this smart contract to help do that. All right. So let's go ahead and create uh, the smart contract that we're going to write in this tutorial series inside this directory right here. So I'm going to create a new file. All right, and we'll create it in this same folder, and we're going to call this Marketplace. So capital M A R K E T P L A C E. All right, dot sol S O L. All right, and this is the file where we'll write all the uh, Solidity source code for the smart contract. So the first thing I want to do inside of here is declare the version of Solidity that we're going to use. All right, we do that like this: say pragma Solidity. All right, and then we use a caret say 0 0.5.0, all right, and then follow that with a semicolon, all right. Next, we declare the smart contract. Uh, we use that with the contract keyword, say contract, and we're going to call this marketplace, just like the file name, all right, and this is going to be the smart contract um, that, you know, handles all of the business logic for uh, buying and selling items on the blockchain, right? It's also going to write to the blockchain and read from the blockchain. So it's going to kind of act like our all-in-one um, backend for this project, okay? So we put all the code for the smart contract inside these curly braces like this, in, you know, inside here. And the first thing I want to do is essentially just... Um, Create a, create a way to make sure that this smart contract gets deployed properly to the blockchain. I don't want to write too much source code inside of here. I just want a simple check, okay? So what we're going to do is give our smart contract a name, and we'll check for that name inside the console, okay? So we do that like this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a variable called name for this, but it's a special kind of variable, right? It's called a state variable. So why is a state variable special? Well, the state variable essentially writes information to the blockchain. You know, the value of that variable is actually stored on the blockchain, all right? And it kind of belongs to this entire smart contract, kind of like a class variable would and maybe another object-oriented programming language. And we, you know, just declare state variables like this. First, we declare the variable type, all right, because Solidity is a statically typed language. So we say string, all right, it's going to be a string. And then we follow that with the variable name like this. We say name, all right. And that's not the very, 
this, this is just the actual name of the variable is name <laughs> because that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to set the uh, variable name. Okay. So that's how you create a state variable. Now, the next thing we want to do is be able to access this variable from outside the smart contract. Okay. So right now we could, you know, update this value and it would write it to the blockchain and we could read this from the blockchain, but currently we can only read this value inside the smart contract itself, right? We want to actually be able to access it from outside. So we declare it public. And this will actually create a function for us where we can, you know, uh, call the function name that will return this variable value uh, whenever we deploy the smart contract. Okay. So next, we actually want to set this value. And there's several ways we could do that. I'm going to do it uh, inside of the constructor for the smart contract, really just to show you how the constructor works. Um, like I said, there's a couple different ways you could do this, but I'll just show you this way. All right. So let's do it this way. We'll say uh, constructor. All right, and this is how you uh, create a constructor. So a constructor is basically just a function uh, inside of Solidity that gets run only one time whenever the smart contract is deployed, all right? So let's say constructor public, all right? And this is um, gonna be where we set the value. We'll say name equals, say DAP University Marketplace, all right? There we go. So that's how we set the value of that name. Okay. And we do this inside the constructor function, which we call constructor. And let's go ahead and see if this works. So I'm going to open up the terminal, go back here and let's first compile the smart contract just to make sure we don't have any errors in the code. So we say truffle compile like this. Oh, looks like we got an issue here. Ah, I see what the problem was. So first we didn't actually install the dependencies for our project, okay? So we cloned the project, um, but we didn't actually run npm install. And I'm actually gonna leave this in the video because this is a common problem that people run into. Um, so I wanna go ahead and fix it for you while uh, I'm on camera. So all these packages inside of here we haven't installed yet. <laughs> so make sure you do this whenever you clone the project. Say npm install, just like that. And I'll just pull this up in case it's getting cut off at the bottom of the screen. We'll wait for all these to uh, download. And you're probably going to see some errors here at this time. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Um, it should install successfully even if you see errors. Um, you can probably just ignore them. Just to make sure that you see a success message at the bottom of the screen. Okay. So here's what I'm talking about. You're starting to see this kind of stuff. Don't worry about that. Um, as long as your build actually succeeds. Okay, so you can see right here, it says optional skipping this, right? Skipping these optional dependencies, don't worry. As long as you see this, you're okay, all right? I haven't run into issues uh, successfully building the project with those errors, okay? All right, so I'll clear that out and we'll try Truffle compile again. We'll say Truffle compile. All right, it worked. And now you can see that it actually put the uh, Com compiled smart contracts in the correct place. So I'll just show you where that is. All right. So we put it inside the source directory under this ABI's directory, and we can actually see the uh, compiled smart contract here. This is a an abstraction that Truffle creates. With, it has an ABI inside of it. I suppose this could be named something a little better because this file actually is more than just an ABI. Here's the ABI. ABI stands for uh, Abstract Binary Interface and basically just describes how the smart contract works um, with, you know, JSON like this. But we can also see you know, the byte code for the compiled smart contract, um, lots of other stuff, okay? So that worked, and this is where the ABIs go inside the project, all right? So the next thing is to actually deploy the smart contracts to a blockchain. We'll do it like this. We'll say truffle migrate, all right? And we can also, oh, actually first, let's just make sure we have ganache running. So that's something that you all will want to do. Say ganache, all right? Wait for this to open. It might open off screen here. So let's actually create a new workspace. So what I'm gonna do is I've I've got an old one here. So let's let's kill that. Remove it. Alright, new workspace. We'll say uh, marketplace. And what you want to do is add your Truffle project. So we can go to add project. Alright, so I found marketplace and inside of here I just want to select the Truffle config file. 
So essentially what this is going to do is link your project to Ganache and it'll show you uh, extra useful event data um, stuff like that whenever you're trying to debug or just you know watch stuff happen on the blockchain okay so we'll add project um, we'll save workspace all right and there you go you got your blockchain running <laughs> and that's something you want to make sure you do before you uh, try to migrate your smart contracts because it won't be successful if you're not connected to ganache and you want to double check that you know port 7545 um, is where ganache is running because that's what you specified here um, and truffle your truffle config file so 7545 okay all right so let's run the migration so truffle migrate hit enter all right it worked so now let's just check um i'm going to clear this out and i'm going to open the truffle console okay i do that like this say truffle console so now you've opened the Truffle console, which is essentially just a uh, JavaScript runtime environment that allows us to interact with our blockchain, okay? And we can interact with smart contracts and uh, just the blockchain itself, okay? So inside of here, you know, we can, we have access to Web3, you know, which is the main uh, JavaScript library for, you know, communicating with the uh, blockchain. So I'm going to pull this up in case it's getting cut off on the screen. Um, and we can see the accounts that are listed uh, with Ganache. We can say web 3 ETH or ETH uh, get accounts and we say that like this we can say uh, accounts equals await web3 ETH get accounts all right enter and it'll say undefined but that's just the return value that's not actually what got assigned to accounts or that's sorry that's, that's what gets logged out so we say accounts all right and now we can see all the accounts that are you know running in ganache so if you go back to ganache that's the same thing all right and now we can, uh, you know, also do really simple stuff like uh, uh, wait, say block number, say wait, web3, eth, uh, get block number. All right, block number. All right, that'll just show you the current block number on the blockchain, right? There you go. So that's the way to just assume that you're actually connected to the blockchain because you can get the block number you can see the accounts and so that way you know you're talking to ganache correctly you're actually talking to the blockchain you set that up well uh, and so the next thing you want to do is actually just check the smart contract so we can get a copy of the deployed smart contract like this we can say uh, marketplace equals capital m marketplace uh, dot deployed all right, I'm gonna call that function. And <laughs> this actually isn't gonna work. Uh, I can see it ahead of time, so we'll go back and fix it, but we'll say await. And we'll say marketplace. All right, so marketplace has not been deployed to a detected network. <laughs> All right, so I, I just realized this was gonna break before I uh, tried it. So let's see why, All right? So I'm, I'm actually gonna leave this in the video. I'm kind of glad it's happening this way that I'm kind of forgetting to do some things because it shows you um, that you can read the errors and then figure out uh, you know why this error is happening and what you need to do differently to fix it. And that's kind of really how <laughs> uh, development works in the real world. So I'm going to exit out of the console and I'm not going to leave you, you know, scratching your head as to why this is happening. I'm just going to tell you. So we didn't actually migrate this smart contract to the blockchain yet. All right. So I'll tell you why. We actually have to create a uh, script to do that. All right. So we see this migrations directory here. You see an initial migrations file. I'm going to create a new one. And I'm going to call this two. All right. And we'll say deploy contracts js all right so this is one and then two and you actually need to order these so that truffle knows the order to run them in so one is the initial one two is the one that we're going to create so i'm just going to copy all the code inside of here and um paste it and i'm going to change all the uh words that say migrations and i'm going to call it marketplace all right so that's pretty simple this file basically just takes the smart contracts and puts them on the blockchain. This is very similar to a migration um, in other contexts. If you've ever worked with like a database before, had to create migrations to add new uh, columns or tables or something like that. It's essentially what this is. It's migrating the database from one state to another. This is migrating the blockchain from one state to another by putting a new uh, smart contract on it. Okay. All right. So let's rerun our migrations. So truffle migrate and do this again. All right, now let's open the Truffle console. 
All right, now let's try this again. We'll say uh, uh, marketplace equals await capital M marketplace dot deployed. All right, so set undefined. That's okay. We didn't actually return the value of the variable. We did that like this, a marketplace. All right, there we go. So now let's uh, get the address. Say marketplace address. All right, there you go. The smart contract actually has an address, so that's good. Now let's check the name that we set up here uh, inside this this uh, state variable. So do that like this. Let's so say name equals await uh, capital M or sorry lowercase m marketplace uh, name. Call the function. And this was the function that was created whenever we declared the state variable public, right? All right, so await name, and then we'll return name like this. So just say name. Boom. There you go. DAP University Marketplace. Awesome. So it worked. We successfully put this smart contract on the blockchain. We've been able to fetch the address and we've been able to fetch the name. So that's a good smoke test to make sure we've got everything set up properly. All right. Um, so that's good. Now, the next thing I want to do just to finalize this smoke test is to create a basic uh, test file that we're going to fill out during the rest of this tutorial. We'll kind of do this in a somewhat test-driven fashion, or at least um, we will prioritize writing tests <laughs> as we uh, create this marketplace smart contract. We'll write tests alongside the Solidity source code, right? So we can write tests in JavaScript inside of this uh, test directory. Actually, I don't see one. So we'll have to create one. So I'll go to the uh, terminal like this and say uh, mkdir. So that stands for make directory. We'll say test. All right. So we can see a new test directory was created here. And let's just touch. That'll create a new file. Uh, test. And we'll say marketplace, capital M, marketplace, uh, test.js. All right. Clear all that out. And inside of here, we have an empty test file. All right, so what I want to do is uh, fill this out and basically check for the same thing we just did in the console. We essentially just want to, um, you know, check that the contract was deployed to the blockchain, has an address, and has a name. So we can import the uh, contract into this test file like this, pretty basic. All right, we just say marketplace, constant marketplace equals artifacts require marketplace.soul. It's a lot like the migration file that we just saw a minute ago, right? Same thing, almost verbatim. Um, and next, we can uh, use Mocha and Chai, which comes with Truffle, okay? So I'll actually just show you that. So Mocha is a testing framework in JavaScript, and this is what comes bundled with Truffle. Um, and Chai is an assertion library that allows you to do uh, assertions in your test, like uh, should be, you know, you know, expect, assert, things like that, right? So that's what we're going to use for this. Um, and we can declare the test for the smart contract like this. We'll say contract, uh, we'll pass in marketplace. All right, and then I will pass in a function. This will be the accounts. All right, and then I will use some curly braces here. And we'll put all the tests inside of here, all right? So the first thing we want to do is uh, create a before, well, let's do this, say let marketplace, so we'll do lowercase. And this is where we'll, we'll just store, we'll store the uh, deployed smart contract with this variable, but we want to declare it at the top because it'll probably change. So, and we also want it to be accessible to the rest of the test. So say before, uh, async. Say marketplace, lowercase equals await. Uh, capital M marketplace deployed. This is just like we did in the console, right? I just did this, and then that's going to get a deployed copy. And the first thing we want to do is say describe uh, deployment. So describe is something that comes with uh, Mocha. Say async. And I'm going to explain this async await that we see all over the place in just a minute. So it, like it deploys successfully. And we'll pass in async. I'm actually be consistent here, sorry. And we'll say uh, const address equals await marketplace address. And now we want to say assert, all right, not equal 
address 0x0. So essentially what this is doing is just getting the address and saying, hey, we want to make sure that it's present, that it exists. It's not equal to this. And we also want to make sure it's not an empty string, that it's not null, and that it's not undefined. So we can also do that just like this. Boom. All right. So let's run this and see if it works. We can go to the terminal like this and say truffle test. All right, and this is gonna actually run all the tests inside of our uh, test directory. In this case, we only have one, so we should find that and run it. All right, and see what happens. All right, there we go, it passes, okay. So now, let's see here. Uh, marketplace deployed, works, works. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is just check that the name was set properly, okay. We'll go back to our test, um, and we'll write a new one. We'll just say it has a name. Say uh, it has a name. Say async. Say const name equals await marketplace name. Say assert equal a name. We'll say dap university marketplace. All right. We'll save that. Run this test. And while this test is running, I want to go and explain something. So you see this keyword async and you say that, see this keyword await everywhere. You know, I did this in the console where I said marketplace equals await, uh, you know, marketplace deployed. So why do we need this await keyword? Well, deployed here is an asynchronous function call. So what does that mean? It basically means that it's going to, uh, it, JavaScript is going to allow you to like resume code execution while this function is still being called, right? Like it doesn't wait for this function to finish before it moves to the next line, okay? So, but if we use the await keyword, it does, all right? And you can only use the await keyword in, in an async context, okay? And that's why we had to have async here. So there's lots of different strategies for doing this. Essentially, uh, this deployed function is asynchronous because function calls from the blockchain are asynchronous because it can take a long time. Um, and so that's why by design it's asynchronous. But if you want to wait to get the smart contract uh, from the blockchain, you have to do it. You have to wait for it. So that's why I use a wait keyword and an async in context. So you'll see this, this is called the async await pattern. And you're gonna see it all throughout this code base uh, in the tests and the console and in the client side application. Okay, so if we, I just wanted to stop and explain that here. You can read more about async await uh, online. So, all right, our past. So there we go. All right, guys, so that's it for this video. Um, this is, you know, the conclusion of the first video where we, uh, you know, set the whole project up. We're talking to the blockchain. We've got a basic smart contract. We've got tests ready to go so we can deploy uh, the smart contracts with confidence, knowing that they work. And we can, um, you know, continue writing tests and continue building out the smart contract in the next video. And that's exactly what we're going to do. All right, so in this video, we're gonna continue on with the progress that we made in the last video where we set everything up, right? We uh, connected to the blockchain, we created this basic smart contract here, this marketplace smart contract, and we wrote a basic test, all right? So you can uh, find the code at this point in the video with the link down in the description below. But uh, yeah, let's continue on with this mar marketplace smart contract and we'll continue writing tests alongside it as we develop it, right? So first things first, make sure you have all your dependencies installed with npm install, all right? And also make sure that you have uh, Ganache running, right? This is your development blockchain. Okay, all right, so let's continue on. The first thing we wanna do with this smart contract um, in this video is actually create a way uh, to add items to the marketplace or products, okay? We wanna basically uh, create a product as a seller, right? We wanna list a product. So in order to do that, we need to uh, model the product in some way, okay? So I'm gonna do that in Solidity with something called a struct. So Solidity allows you to create your own data structures like this, so say struct, and we'll just call it a product. Okay, and we can really give this any kind of attribute that we want to, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is give this struct an ID, say uint ID, all right? So uint stands for unsigned integer. That basically just means that it can be um, uh, a number uh, without a minus sign in front of it. It has to be positive. You know, a sign is a, is a minus or a plus, and this is always gonna be positive. Okay, so we'll say a string, 
uh, name. String's pretty self-explanatory, just like this. And we'll also give it a price, say so uint price, all right, and then we'll give it uh, an address of the owner. All right, so this is going to be the person who owns the product, and when we're listing it, it's going to be the product uh, seller, but whenever it's purchased, this is actually going to change to the new owner, which will be uh, the buyer, okay? So then we'll also have a Boolean for purchased, see whether the product has already been purchased in the marketplace or not. All right, so this is how we're gonna model the product. We just create this basic struct that gives it these attributes, all right? So now we need a place to put this newly created structure. So also I'll mention this is just a description of how a product works. Uh, it's not necessarily an, an individual product. Each newly created product will follow this pattern, all right? So anytime we create a new product, we need a place to put them. Um, and we're going to use something called a mapping in Solidity, all right? And we'll create the new mapping like this. We'll use the mapping keyword, mapping. And uh, so essentially a mapping is a, a key value uh, relationship. So it's like a, a hash table or uh, an associative array or a hash or an object in other languages where basically we have a key and a value. So in this case, the key is going to be the product ID, all right? And then the value is going to be just this whole product struct like this. So uh, the ID is going to be an unsigned integer like we declared here. So we'll, we'll show the key map, sorry, the key value relationship like this. We'll say uint. Uh, and then we'll pass in the value to be a product. And then we'll call this products. All right. So now we have our syntax highlighting back. All right. So basically, uh, here's the mapping, right, that we've declared. The key is an unsigned integer, which will be an ID. And then the value will be a product data type, which we, we created here when we created this struct. Okay. And this can be products mapping is the name of it. Now we want to be able to access this products mapping uh, outside of the smart contract, not just inside of it. So we'll call it public, just like we did with the name. So public. All right. So there you go. Now we have a place to put these products. Okay. So also, um, we need a way to know how many products exist inside of this mapping. So you could have this giant, you know, lookup with IDs and products like we do it here. But the problem with Solidity is you really have no way of knowing uh, how big this mapping is. It's just a limitation of the EVM. So basically, if uh, you created a product and you only had five, you don't know that there's only five inside of here. You know, if you looked for product five, it would return a product. But if you looked for product six, it would just return a blank uh, struct with default values, which would be like zero, empty string, zero, uh, zero x zero, and false. So we need a way to know how many products are inside of here because whenever we list them out, we want to know how many there are and actually get them one by one. All right, so we'll do that like this. We'll create a counter cache. We'll say uh, uint. Uh, public, just like everything else, and say product, sorry, product count, all right? So that's gonna be something that we can use to know how many products exist inside this mapping. We'll just increment this anytime we add a new product. We'll just, we'll increase it by one, all right? So we can use a default value right now. We can say equals zero, all right? So there we go, we've got a way to uh, describe a product and put it on the blockchain. That's another thing I'll mention. This mapping uh, is a state variable. So anytime we add you know, new products here, they're getting put on the blockchain when they're inserted into this mapping. And when we read them out of the mapping, they're getting read from the blockchain. Okay, same thing with this product count. All right, so now that we have a way to put them on the blockchain, let's actually do it. So we're gonna create a new function called uh, create product. We'll do it like this. We'll say function create product. All right, and we're gonna pass in some values and then we'll put it inside of here, all right? But I'm gonna fill this out. Let's actually write some tests as we do this. So I'm gonna open up uh, a new column and put the tests over here and the Solidity source code on one side. All right, so inside of here, basically what we wanna do is uh, a few things. We want to you know create the product. We want to trigger an event, basically tell the blockchain that something happened, 
And we also want to make sure that the product is correct before we do it. Uh, make sure parameters are correct. So basically, we're going to accept some parameters inside this function. We want to make sure that they're correct before we create the product. We want to create it, and then we want to trigger the event. All right. So that's three things that we'll do. And we'll write test to check for this. Okay. So first, uh, what I'll do is create a test over here. And we'll say, uh, give ourselves some space just so that we can see. Just like describe deployment, we'll do this. We'll say, uh, we'll just copy and paste. We'll say describe uh, products. And we're going to take this out. I'm going to copy this before filter. Or sorry, before hook. And I'm going to paste it like this just so that I'm not you know, writing code a bunch of times. And inside of here, I'm going to create the product first. Okay. So let's just say let result product count. So I'm going to uh, basically create some variables here that we'll update later. But inside of here, I'm going to say result. And then I want to basically just say await. Uh, we've already got marketplace. So I'll do it like this. Uh, I'll say create product. All right. So that's going to create the product first. Then we're just going to test. Uh, let's just make sure that it actually incremented the product count uh, to one. So say creates products. All right. So let's take out all of this. So I did this kind of fast, but I basically wanted to show you what I'm uh, checking for. So what we want to do is basically, um, well, actually, we need to fetch the product count. So let's do it like this. Let's do that like this. So we'll say results, and we'll say product account. All right. So I know I did that kind of fast, but let me just go over what I did. So we said describe uh, products. And like I said, you can download the source code or you can just pause this point in the video and try to digest some of this code. So uh, for products, we want to just make sure that it creates a product. We're going to fill this out more, but at first we basically just want to say that the product count uh, changed whenever we added a new one, okay? And we just created product count over here, and we want it to go from zero to one, all right? And before we actually check for this, we're gonna, you know, try to call the create product function, which is we're gonna fill out right here, right? We're gonna add some arguments inside of here. So we can say create product, and we could go ahead and just increment that value. Let's go ahead and do that, all right? So let's uh, say product count. So let's say, uh, Increment product count. Do that here. Say product count plus plus. All right, so let's run this test. Should work. All right, so while that's running, basically we're going to check for the product count. And then next, we're going to accept some arguments inside of here, right? This is going to be what we actually. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're we're gonna say we want to create a product with a few attributes. So we can say uh, string memory uh, name. The product's gonna have a name, right? We're gonna set this, and we're gonna set the price as well. All right, and then say uh, uint price. Okay, I'm gonna go back and do this as one tab for a second, just so you can see the code. Um, and we'll also call this uh, public so that we can call it. I think we're not going to be able to do that. Our test is going to fail. All right, yeah. So we got an issue here. Um, sorry, guys. Let's, uh, let's just continue on with this, and we'll increment the count as we go, all right? So memory name, you went price, public, all right? So we want to accept some arguments. We want to make sure it just increments the count first, okay? So we'll set all these here in a minute, but let's just fix the problem that we have. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, you got parsing, marketplace soul, expected that, oh, I see. I didn't, I didn't add a semicolon. So we could try to run this again. Let's just uh, take these out, but leave public, right? You need public in order to be able to call this function. So save that, uh, I'll rerun it, trouble test. I'll just wait instead of continuing on. All right, it worked. So it actually incremented the product count, okay? So now let's continue on building this out. I'm gonna put these back in here. So basically string memory name, all right? And then you int price, okay? And we're just gonna increment the product count like that. 
So let's go over here and add this. So we'll create a name. We'll just say iPhone uh, X. And as a price, we're going to um, specify this in terms of Ether, all right? So I'll explain that. Basically, the price we're gonna we're gonna purchase, you know, items from the marketplace with Ethereum cryptocurrency or Ether. Okay, so the price is gonna be expressed in Ether. So but whenever we store, you know, Ether on the blockchain, uh, we store it in something called Way. All right, so Way is basically the smallest denomination of Ether. You can go to this uh, website, EtherConverter.online, to see uh, the different values of Ether. So if you subdivide Ether smaller and smaller and smaller, you eventually get to weigh. It's sort of like Ethereum's penny. It's like a really, really small penny, okay? And we deal with this value. So this is one followed by 18 decimal places, which is basically one Ether uh, divided by decimal places, all right? You'll see, um, you'll see other values like Gwei a lot, right? So we're gonna deal with weigh. So how we can do that in our test is basically, um, say we're going to do iPhone X, but we're going to create a product in way. So we want to say, so say one followed by 18 decimal places. So we want to say one ether, but to store one ether, we have to do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, in order to create a uh, one way or sorry, one ether expressed in way. That's what ether looks like as way. And smart contracts always deal in way values like this. Okay. So, I don't want to do that, um, but that's what it would look like if you wrote it out literally. So I'm going to say uh, web3 uh, utils two-way, and I'm going to pass in one, all right, and say ether. And that will convert it for us automatically. All right, so let's go ahead and rerun the test. We didn't change anything inside of the uh, Solidity smart contract necessarily. We just uh, accepted some arguments, and that's what I want to do here. All right. All right, still works just fine. So it's yelling at us that we have some unused function parameters, but that's okay, we're gonna use them now. So we'll go back to uh, the smart contract and let's actually do some stuff. So inside of here, we wanna create a new product and add it to the mapping. We'll do that like this. We'll basically just say, uh, after we've incremented the products count, we'll say products, say product count, and we'll say equals. We'll create a new product like this, we'll say product, all right, let's say product count. We, we, so we need to give it several uh, attributes. The ID, all right, so in this case, it's just gonna be the product count because we incremented it. All right, you see why I'm using this counter cache? Like the counter cache always corresponds to the, the most recent ID, right? So product count zero, we increment it, it turns into one, which becomes the ID of the first product, right? And so on and so forth. So product count, and we'll say, uh, Say name, all right, price, all right, which we'll fill out, in this, which we'll get from here. And then also uh, we wanna say the owner. So the owner is gonna be the person who called this function. And we have access to that inside of Solidity with something called msg.sender, all right? So msg is a global keyword in Solidity and sender is the value of the person who called the function. This is gonna be an Ethereum address um, like you saw in uh, Ganache, all right? So then we're gonna say, is it purchased? And since we just created it, it will not be purchased, so we'll call it false, okay? All right, so that creates a new product. Let's just go ahead and rerun the test to make sure everything's working correctly, and then we will uh, check for that in the, um, in the test. All right, it passed. So in order to test for the uh, product, I wanna make sure that it was actually logged out. Okay, so, we can check the logs by triggering events inside of Solidity. All right, this is really helpful. You can use this for a lot of stuff. I wanna show you how to use events right now. All right, so we'll first need to define an event. We do that like this. We can say uh, event, we'll capitalize this and say product created. All right, and I'm gonna open this up like this. And inside of here, we're gonna just pass in all the values from the product. Basically, we'll use kind of these same. So I'm just gonna copy them, paste them here. And instead of semicolons, we're gonna use uh, commas. And we'll delete the last one. All right, so we got ID, name, price, address of the owner, and also purchased. Okay, so this is how you create a new event inside of Solidity. And we're going to trigger it right here. Kind of the same way uh, we did this. We're just gonna emit the event with these values. We'll say uh, emit. 
um, product created. All right, and I'll pass in the values. Uh, let's actually just copy all these. So do this, pass them in. And now we'll be able to see this logged out whenever we call the function inside of our test, okay? And I'll show you how to do that. Basically, I'll just console log it. We'll go back to our test file and inside of here, we'll say const event equals uh, results. All right, so result, actually let's do this. Before we store it, let's do uh, console log. Result uh, logs. All right, so we'll just check the logs, run the test. And I'll show you what's inside the logs. And we're going to dig into those logs to uh, fetch these values, you know, inside of here. I'll show you how to do that, okay? All right, so it looks like we had a uh, problem here. So let's just fix this. Uh, let's see here, parse contract, expected. Oh, so I, left, I forgot a semicolon again. Uh, let's see, where did I do that? All right, so I forgot the semicolon after the event. Sorry, guys. Uh, so on line 22, make sure you got a semicolon after you declare the event. We're on the test again. So this is another reason we have tests to check our errors, uh, make sure that stuff's working properly. All right, so another issue here. Um, I named the event the wrong thing. <laughs> so I forgot a D. All right, one more time. Sorry, guys. Run the tests again, and this will hopefully pass this time. And we'll be able to see the uh, product logged up to the screen. Okay, so it's passing. And here's what we logged, right? So I, re I logged out uh, the logs from this result that came back whenever we create the product. All right, and inside of here, we see uh, some values. We see a result, all right? And it's got some stuff inside of here, right? You see this ID. You got this name, price. All right, so we want to dig into this and pull these values out and check them to make sure that they're correct, that the name is right, that the price is correct, that the owner is correct, all right, all that kind of stuff. So we can fetch that like this. Uh, we'll just say uh, const result like this. Say const result equals, um, or sorry, const event equals result dot logs and then we'll get the first one it's an array so it's a zero base index array we'll get the first one and say args all right we just saw that so here's the args okay args result so that'd be the event and we want to dig into those values so first we wanted to say uh assert equal uh event dot id uh to number i'm going to convert it to a number uh, is the same thing as the product count to number. And we'll just say ID is correct. We'll do the same thing. Uh, I'm actually going to just copy this. Uh, event dot. Let's say this uh, is correct. Just going to copy this and do it three more times. So event uh, dot name is the same thing as the, is, let's just do it literally here. We'll say iPhone X, we'll just copy it. So name is correct. And then also event dot price. And I'm gonna do this literally as well, just to show you that this converts into way. So we'll say one uh, followed by 18 zeros. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, we'll say price is correct. And then also the owner is correct. And we're going to track the owner. Okay. So I'm going to come back to this. I'll show you in a second. So purchased. And we're just going to say false. Purchased is correct. So let's check for the owner. All right, so the owner, let's actually break some of these up. So if you go to the top of your test file here, this just says accounts, all right? This is gonna be all the accounts that are injected from Ganache, right? If you pull up Ganache, you'll see all these accounts, right? So you can actually uh, access these individually since this is an array, we can break them up like this. And we can say, you know, account one, account two, account three, all right? But I'm actually gonna name these accounts We'll say account one is going to be the deployer. All right. And then account two is going to be a seller. And account three is going to be a buyer. All right. 
So what we want to do here is basically just make sure that uh, the owner is the seller. All right. So in order to do that, we want to basically say that this person who created the product is the same thing as seller, but we need to tell uh, the test that the seller is the one calling this function. And we do that exactly like this. We add some function metadata. So after the normal arguments are passed in, uh, we pass in an object and we say from, and we say seller. All right. And that is exactly how Solidity knows that uh, MSG sender, right, is the seller. So MSG.sender comes from the metadata from the function. And that's exactly what uh, you see here. All right. Okay, so that's a little complicated, but let's save this, run the test, and see if it works. All right, works. So it successfully creates products. All right, so I think that may actually be all we need for this particular part of the tutorial, okay? Well, actually, sorry, there's, that's, that's all we need for the success case. Let's also check for failures, all right? All right, so what we want to do is uh, make sure that a few things are correct. So we want to make sure that the name um, is, is there, which require name. And then we also want to require a price, a valid, valid price. All right, so the first thing we want to do is use these require statements. So we say require, um, we'll say the name, and we basically want to check for the length uh, that it's greater than zero. So essentially we want, you just don't want to be a blank name, right? So basically anything inside of this, if it evaluates to true, uh, this function will continue execution, but if it evaluates to false, it'll stop execution and throw an exception, okay? And, you know, they won't pay any gas or anything like that, okay? So, um, let's say bytes. We actually need to do that. Sorry, bytes, name, length is greater than zero. That just checks that the string actually has data inside of it, all right? Same thing for price. So say require uh, price is greater than zero. Sorry. Zero, and uh, yeah, that'll work. All right. So let's just run the test, make sure it still works. Should be fine. And then we'll test for the uh, failures in a second. And also while this is happening, I want to make a mention of something. You see these underscore uh, variable names? Basically, I'm using underscores here as a convention to show that these are local variables and not state variables, right? So all the state variables uh, don't have underscores in front of them. It's kind of a convention from other programming languages. I try to use the same thing. You know, for example, we have underscore name here and uh, name here. Uh, without underscores, so that prevents you know, conflicts and stuff like that. All right, so that's just uh, something I wanted to mention. Okay, all right, there we go. So now what we can do is actually check for this in the test. We'll just uh, check for failures, but before we do that, we need to import something new into our uh, project, into our test suite here. We're going to use a special um, chai dependency that we installed inside of our package.json file. It's already there. We're going to use chai as promised, okay, and should. So just add this to the top, all right? So you can pause the video or get this from the source code if you want to. Basically, we're going to require chai. We want to use uh, chai as promised, which is in our package.json file, and we want to use should, okay? So you need this before you continue. So let's scroll down, go to the failures. The first thing we want to check for is that uh, if we create... Uh, a product without a name is going to mess up. So say a product must have a name. And we'll say await a marketplace. Oops, marketplace. Uh, create product. Let's actually just do this. We'll just copy it. All right, let's do this. Marketplace. And let's just take the name out. So no name. And we'll say uh, should be rejected. All right, so that's how you check for the failure. And that's why we just imported this stuff, should. So should be rejected. And let's use shuffle test. 
see if this works. All right, so it was supposed to be rejected, but it was fulfilled. And so what's the issue here? All right. <laughs> I think I see what happened. So <laughs> it's funny. I was talking about these uh, local variables. We need to put an underscore here. <laughs> so we want local variable name, not the global variable name. Because <laughs> name was already set, but um, this wasn't. So <laughs> make sure you use your underscore here. Uh, it's funny that I just mentioned that and then I messed it up myself. So let's try the test again. Shuffle test, and this should uh, pass this time. But it's good that, you know, we caught our error and we see that our tests are actually working. So that's good. All right, there we go. So now let's check for the failure that it has a price. So go back here and we'll just copy all this. Uh, probably must have a price. So we'll put the name back in. We'll say iPhone X is fine. All right, and also we want to just use a blank price. So we'll just say zero. All right, see if this works. All right, and it passes. All right, in the last video, we you know created a product right inside the smart contract. And in this video, we're going to allow people to purchase the products. Okay, so we're gonna test for that. Um, but really quickly, we're gonna test that we can actually read products out of this mapping, right? We wanna be able to fetch products. So it's sort of like create, read, and update. That are gonna be the main um, functions of the smart contracts when it comes to products. So let's make sure we can read the product out of this mapping, right? So let's go to the test really quickly. We're going to create a new test down here. Just below, um, it creates products. We'll just say um, it lists products. And let's just actually copy this. So we're not just writing code over and over again. Uh, I'll do this. Say it lists products. All right, so inside of here, what I want to do is basically say const products. I want to fetch them from the blockchain, from the okay. smart contracts. So I'll say await uh, marketplace products. All right, we're just going to call this function right here. All right, products right here. And we're going to pass in uh, the product count which we set in this before uh, action right here. So product count. All right, so let's just do that. And we'll check that the uh, values are correct. So I'm just gonna copy this so that it looks kind of the same. Um, we'll say, uh, instead of event, we'll change this to product. All right, and this should be actually be product, not products, sorry. So, like I said earlier, we have to, we have to fetch products out of here one by one, which we do like this, product equals product count, all right? Or product equals this product with the index of product count, all right, or ID. All right, so let's run this test. Should just pass like it is, truffle test. All right, it worked. So let's go back into our test. Um, looks like everything's fine here. So now let's say that it also uh, creates, uh, sorry, purchases products or sells products, sells products, okay? So let's uh, just clear this out and we'll fill out this test. But simultaneously, we're going to uh, create a new function inside of the smart contract to actually facilitate the purchasing process. So down here, I'm just gonna give myself some extra space so you can see this on screen just fine. All right, so we'll say function, uh, purchase product. We'll pass in an ID. So we'll just tell it the exact ID the product we want to purchase. We'll say it calls public. And the first thing we want to, or the, then we're going to do several things inside of here, right? We're going to have to say we're going to fetch the product. All right, we're going to uh, fetch the owner. All right. We're going to make sure the product is valid. Like it can be purchased. Uh, we're going to per we're going to basically purchase it. And we're going to uh, trigger an event. 
It's gonna be a lot of steps inside of here, but that's high level what we're gonna do, all right? So let's actually just do the uh, uh, purchase like this. We'll say, we'll do the basic part first. So first we wanna fetch it. We'll just say product equals, uh, actually do this, product memory, product equals products ID. All right, so let me explain this. Essentially what we're doing is we're instantiating a new product, you know, that we created here, this product struct, like this, but we're doing it in memory, right? We're having a new copy of it, not the one that actually exists in the blockchain, and we're assigning it to a local product variable with this underscore, all right? And we're just saying, hey, fetch that particular product out of the product's mapping and, you know, create this new copy in memory like this, okay? That's why we have this memory keyword. All right, so next we want to uh, actually fetch the seller. So we say address uh, seller equals the product owner. Because if the product hasn't been sold already, that's who the owner is, is the seller, okay? Um, so now we want to basically, we won't check for validity just yet, we'll do that last. Uh, let's actually transfer the ownership. So that's what we do whenever we purchase it. So we'll say transfer ownership uh, to the buyer. So we'll do that like this. We'll say product owner now equals the buyer, which in this case is going to be the person who is calling the function. So that's going to be msg.sender. And I explained msg.sender here, right? Um, and now we're going to market as purchased. So we'll say product purchased equals true. We're going to uh, update the product in the mapping. All right, we'll say products uh, ID equals pro uh, product. All right, so this product that we've edited, basically we've created a new copy in memory here. Uh, we have assigned a new owner, but we've stashed, we've, you know, uh, we've tracked the seller before we did that. And then we, uh, you know, transfer the ownership. You said that it's now purchased and we put it back in the products mapping like this. All right. So now what we need to do is actually pay the seller. So whenever we call this function, we're going to actually send in some cryptocurrency to purchase the product, right? We're not just going to transfer the ownership. We're also going to pay the seller. All right, pay the seller by sending them ether. All right, so you're gonna see this in a test, but essentially uh, we can pass in ether with this function call, okay? Um, actually just illustrate it before I do it, okay? So, because this can get kind of confusing. But basically what we're gonna do is, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do the function like this. We'll say um, result equals, we're not going to run this yet. I'm just going to show you high level what it looks like. Await, marketplace, uh, purchase product. We're going to use product count as the ID. And so that, you know, that's the only uh, argument that this function accepts is, is the, is the um, ID, right? But we can additionally pass function metadata like we did here. All right, this is from seller. All right, but we want to say from buyer, right? It's going to be a new account, and this is the from. But we can also send Ether in with this function call, okay? So we can give it arguments, but we can also say, uh, hey, send some cryptocurrency. And that's actually how we're going to pay for the product. And we do that with a value, all right? And this value is going to be, you know, the price of the product, in this case, you know, one Ether or, you know, this many way, and we can just use that same value from the test, right? This is the product price. Uh, let's just pass in the value like this, all right? So that's the actual product price. So that's msg.value, okay? So that's gonna get sent in as function metadata and we can access that uh, inside of the smart contract like this. We can basically just say uh, msg.value, all right? That's gonna be the the amount of ether that's sent in with the function call. Okay, so now we want to actually transfer that value to the seller. So let's do like this. We'll say address seller, right, which we dashed right here. Click transfer. 
All right, MSG dot value. Boom, easy as that. That's how you do it. That's how we pay the seller. We basically take the ether that came in and, and send it to them that way. All right. So there are a few things that we need to do in order to make this work. We need to modify this function. First, we need to make this function payable. All right, so Solidity won't let us uh, send in ether with a function unless we've used this payable modifier right here. That's what allows us to do this uh, value metadata, okay? And likewise, we need to make sure that this seller address is payable. So we'll say payable here. Sorry, payable. And we also need to make sure that that is declared uh, payable everywhere else inside of the smart contract where we, you know, uh, use this address. So address payable is a modifier. So we'll say address. So let's see here. Here, are these two places. All right. So address payable. All right. And then address payable. So it's really critical that you get these right or else it's not going to work. And then also, um, yeah, that's how you do it. So that's how you transfer Ether to the seller. You got to make sure everything's payable, all right? So last, we want to trigger an event, all right? So now what we want to do is you know, use this product created event, and we want to basically say um, product purchased. And we just really want to use the same values as... Um, this event, we just call it a different name, all right? So just like this, you can trigger an event, copy this and just change the name, product purchased, all right? And the last final thing we're gonna wanna do is uh, make sure this product's valid. You know, we'll have some requirements just like we did up here, but we're gonna do that last. Let's go ahead and write some tests just to make sure that all this stuff works. All right, so first, let's just truffle compile. Make sure I don't have any uh, syntax errors. I've been bad about that in the previous videos. So we'll go ahead and run that basic check first. All right, so we got some issues here. Um, let's see, so undeclared identifier, did you mean name, All right? So that doesn't know about the name. So we'll need to actually uh, do that. We'll say uh, product name. All right, and then also product price. All right, so that's just a copy and paste error. Let's try it again, truffle compile. All right, so it compiled properly. Now let's write some tests to you know check on this behavior. All right, so the first thing we did was um, set up the result, okay, and we wanted to see that um, yeah we could we could pass in the buyer and we could also pass in the value. So that illustrated how that worked, but we're going to use that as a starting point for our our, our test. So we'll say uh, success buyer makes purchase. All right. And what we want to do is go ahead and check these logs, just like we did in the previous test, to make sure that all this info was uh, logged out properly. So I'm just going to copy this. Uh, let's say const event. All right. And we'll say check logs. So inside of the logs, we want to make sure that the event ID is the same as the product ID. So that's, that's good. Um, the name is right, the price is correct, the owner is now the buyer, not the seller, all right, and purchased is now true. All right, so let's run that test. Say truffle test, and I'll pull this up so that you can see it, make sure it's not cutting off from the screen. All right, so it looks like there's an issue here. We got one failure, expected, purchased, uh, see it expected true, but got false. So let's make sure we updated that correctly. All right, so that's another thing we need to change. So purchase should be true here in the uh, event. So that was my fault. Sorry, guys. We'll run the test again. But hey, that's why we write tests. You know, we make sure that stuff works properly. All right, it passed. So that's good. We checked the logs. The logs are correct. So the next things we want to do, hmm, let's see here. Let's check for, let's check to make sure that the seller receives the funds. All right. Seller received funds. So this is gonna be a little complicated. Um, the first thing we wanna do is actually, well, we, we wanna do this. Basically, we wanna see how much they had before and then see how much they had after and make sure that the difference is the same as the product amount, right? So now you'll see um, some, you know, you'll see like in Ganache, 
these balances are changing and it's going to change all the time because you know we're running these tests and ether is going to get transferred anytime we sell a product and you also see these little you know tiny amounts go down um that's because these are paying for gas fees whenever uh we're calling functions right or deploying smart contracts or anything like that right whenever we list the product we're going to pay gas fees whenever we purchase the product we're going to pay gas fees so basically the ethereum network requires you to pay gas anytime you make a transaction we'll talk about that more whenever we you know build out the client side application you'll be able to see it more explicitly in metamask but just know these values are going to change like crazy so we don't know what they're going to be before we run the test so we need to check we'll basically just say uh you know track the seller balance before purchase all right so we'll say let old seller balance uh we'll say old seller balance equals await web3 we can just check the balance like this web3 eth get balance and we'll say seller all right let's say old seller balance let's format it web3 utils we're going to convert it to a big number all right so we want to use big numbers because we want to use big number addition whenever we do the math all right so let's say let new seller balance this is going to be after the transaction has taken place. Uh, I'll say new seller balance equals await. Let's just do this, actually. Basically, just copy this. Change, change old seller balance to new seller balance. All right. So now, uh, I'll say let price. Uh, price equals uh, web3 utils. Two-way. Say one... Uh, ether all right this is the price that we you know paid for everything all right and then price we'll convert it to a big number just like everything else uh, say new uh web3 utils uh bn say new seller balance oops i made a mistake here so this should be uh price sorry and also i don't know why i'm saying a wait here so whenever we create a big number we say new sorry <laughs> um same thing up here so i'm just gonna you know if you want to just pause the video really quickly and just look at this screen to make sure your code is the same right that might be helpful all right so yeah i'm gonna wait say new await new all right same thing here all right so now what we want to do is basically uh, let's just log these out so let's say console log uh say new seller balance or uh, old seller balance new seller balance and then price all right and let's just uh say treble test let's just see what gets logged out to make sure we've formatted everything properly at this point because we're essentially going to do is do some math and make sure that the new seller balance is basically the old seller balance plus the price okay but we want to make sure that we've set all this up before we start adding things together all right so here's a big number here's a big number and here's a big number i can't actually tell what these are by looking at them but i'm going to assume that they're right so let's uh try to add them together in our test and actually create the assertion so we'll go back here and say uh Cont expected balance equals old seller balance add uh, price. So you add as a function that exists on big numbers, which we have here. All right. So it's going to be expected balance. And then we'll finally check. We'll say assert uh, equal uh, new seller balance. And then it's the expected balance to string. All right. So new seller balance uh let's actually do this to string let's just convert them both to string just to make sure all right so let's uh say truffle test and hopefully this works <laughs> all right it passes so we now see that the uh seller received the funds whenever the product was sold in the marketplace all right perfect Okay, so we've made pretty good progress. We've tested for a lot of the core functionality inside of this uh, purchase product function, okay? So the last thing we wanna do is uh, check for failures, just like we did in our previous uh, tests and functions, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if you go to the uh, top here, 
you know, we tested for failures. We, you know, made sure it had a name, all that kind of stuff. So let's check for a few failures here. Uh, I'm gonna give ourselves some space just so that we have, uh, you can see it on screen. So let's check for a few things. Let's, um, hmm. First, let's require that uh, the product exists. So basically, we want the ID to be correct. So if we only have five products and they send in like, you know, product 99, we want to stop execution. So make sure um, the product has valid ID. So we'll say require, uh, let's say product ID is greater than zero and it's also uh is less than the product count all right so next we're going to check that uh there's enough ether in the transaction so whenever they you know actually uh you know sent this function or called this function that they sent the right amount of ether so say require uh i'll say actually require that there is enough ether in the transaction so in the code, we'll say require uh, MSG to value is greater than or equal to, sorry, greater than or equal to the product price. All right. Next, we'll say uh, require uh, that the product has not already been purchased. All right, we'll say require uh, bang product so basically if product purchase is tr false we'll just use the opposite of that all right and if it's true we'll also use the opposite of that that's what this bang operator means all right so also require that the buyer is oops sorry it's not the seller so require uh seller is not msg sender all right we don't want someone to be able to purchase their own product okay we don't want it to be already purchased. We want it to have a valid, you know, price. Whenever this gets sent in, all that stuff. All right. So that's all the requirements that we need. Now we can um, test for all that in our tests. I'm gonna go ahead and clean up the source code here to remove all the extraneous spaces. We'll just compile this. Truffle compile. Make sure that we didn't make any syntax errors. All right. Compile properly. So now let's go to our tests and let's check for the first failure. All right. The first failure is going to be. Uh, let's see, it tries to buy a product that does not exist. Basically, we want to use an invalid ID. All right. So we'll say buy a product that does not exist, i.e., uh, product must have valid ID. All right. So let's just copy this and say this, take away the results. Purchase product product count let's say like 99 and then should be rejected all right let's run the test all right so we got some issues here uh, we got to revert all right so i got a little issue here so let's actually go back into the code we want to make sure that the product count is this so um not just less than it can be less than or equal to all right so let's save this i'll rerun the test all right like this all right and it passes so let's uh go back to marketplace tests and let's write some more tests here. We're gonna go ahead and just step through these uh, to wrap up this video. So we'll say, let's make sure that we buy with enough ether, okay? So um, we'll try to send too little, right? So not enough ether. So we'll just do that like this. We'll just say, uh, right, marketplace purchase product, and we will use our valid ID, but we basically only use like half the amount of ether. So it costs one ether, but we're gonna send in 0 0.5, all right? So next thing we want to do is uh, make sure that they try to buy the product uh, from somebody else. Basically, like we're going to try to purchase it twice, and we don't want that to happen. So we're going to do that from the deployer account like this. So we'll say purchase product, product account. We do it from the deployer. So it's somebody else. It's like you know a third party that hasn't even interacted with this transaction yet, but it's already been purchased. So we want it to fail. So we'll check for it that way. All right, the correct amount of ether. All right, should be rejected. The last is we don't want the buyer to be able to buy the product twice. All right, so the buyer can't be the seller essentially. 
All right, we just we just basically just try to purchase the product again uh, from the buyer to make sure that that won't work. All right, so it should be rejected. All right, so uh, let's just clean up this. I'm gonna try to run the tests, and that should be all that we need for this smart contract. Say truffle tests. All right, all right, it works. There you go. That's all the tests, and they're passing. Okay, so that's everything that we need for this marketplace smart contract. This is our complete blockchain backend that we're going to use uh, whenever we build out you know, this full stack application. This is everything we need. So we've got tests for this. You know, it's really important to test your smart contracts before you put them on the blockchain because um, the code can't change, right? So let's uh, go ahead and deploy these to the blockchain and we'll wrap up this video. So the truffle uh migrate all right it worked so let's just open the console really quickly truffle console all right let's just check uh let's say marketplace actually let's just copy the code here we'll say uh sorry do it like this boom all right there we go marketplace All right, it's got an address. All right, cool. So everything works. All right, so that's, um, you know, our smart contracts are on the blockchain now, and we've got everything that we need to, you know, start building out the client-side application for this full-stack blockchain app. And that's exactly what we're going to get started doing in the next video. All right, so now let's go ahead and start building out our client side application, okay? So first and foremost, you know, just make sure you've got Ganache running, all right? And also, you know, make sure you've you know, deployed the smart contracts to the blockchain, which we did in the last video, okay? So what I'm gonna do is actually open up uh, a new tab here so that we can run the server that we're gonna use to develop our application, our client side app. And I'm gonna start it like this. I'll say npm run start. All right, and what that's going to do is open up a browser for you. All right, now you should see your front-end application open with this uh, boilerplate code from the starter kit that you installed at the beginning of this series. All right, so while we're here, let's go ahead and uh, talk about MetaMask. This is a little fox icon uh, up in the right-hand corner. So MetaMask is the uh, browser extension that's going to turn your web browser into a blockchain browser. It's going to allow us to connect to Ganache, right, this right here. So what we want to do is take some of the accounts from Ganache and import them into MetaMask. I'm going to go ahead and copy this uh, second account here. You can see this address. This is sort of like the username. But we want the account password, essentially, in order to rebuild it in MetaMask, in order to import it. So we'll show the private key. All right, so don't ever do this for a real account. And I should also say, well, I mean, you can import an account, a real account with a private key, but don't show anyone. That's what I mean. So like, for example, don't ever use this private key to store any real cryptocurrency, all right? Because everyone who watched this video has seen it. So we'll copy that, and we'll go to MetaMask, and we will import the account. Um, I'm going to say import account, private key, paste it in here, import, all right? So I'm actually going to give this account a name. So click this menu here, uh, click details, edit with the pencil icon, and we're going to call this the seller. This is going to make it easy to understand who's doing what in our scenario here. All right. And I'm going to import another account. So I'll take this account here, show the private key. Again, don't ever use this. Um, and then import account. Say import account, private key, import. All right, we'll edit this. Hamburger icon, details, pencil. And then we'll call this the buyer. So let's switch back to the seller account. And let's connect to Ganache, all right? So you'll see this main Ethereum network, and you'll see Robston, Kovan, et cetera, et cetera. We want to connect to localhost port 7545, because that's what Ganache is running on. So 127001-7545. All right, boom, there we go. Now we can see our balance uh, from Ganache actually listed here, all right? And that means we are connected, because it knows how much cryptocurrency we have in our wallet. And now our browser is actually talking to Ganache, right? So now we can uh, you know, get set up to run this blockchain app. Okay, so this is the boilerplate code that from the starter kit that you installed at the very beginning of this tutorial series, right? So if you go uh, inside of you know your app, your code, let's go back to the code here and open this in Sublime Text. 
I'm going to say subl dot to open this in Sublime Text. And if you go to the source directory and you see uh, components, right, this app.js file, this is all the code that you see visually on the screen here. It's all the HTML. So what do we got here? Well, we've got Bootstrap wired up for us, right? The templating framework, so we don't have to write a bunch of HTML and CSS ourselves. Uh, it looks nice already, so that's good. And we're using React.js, okay? So if you look at this, you can see some uh, JavaScript code mixed with this HTML, right? That's just how React works. So don't worry if you don't uh, know React, if you haven't been built an app in React before. I'm going to teach you everything you need to know to follow along with this tutorial and get started, okay? So let's briefly... Uh, oh, take a look at React. So React is a component-based library uh, in JavaScript that's used for building user interfaces. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're building a user interface for this blockchain application, this dApp, that talks to Ethereum smart contracts for our marketplace, okay? So uh, it's component-based, uh, you know, Basically, components are the fundamental building blocks of uh, React applications, all right? You can see uh, this HTML code mixed in with JavaScript. It's all kind of intermingled together. Uh, you see this class hello message extends React component. That's how you define a React component, and you can just see this result here. Here's the real basic um, HTML. See this.props.name. I'll explain all this as we go, okay? Also, um, React also has a state for each component. So what do I mean by that? Well, web applications need to manage state, right? They don't uh, persist across web page refreshes. And we want to basically mirror the state of the blockchain inside of our app. So what do I mean by that? Basically, our marketplace you know, has products in it. We want our front-end app to list those products you know, a lot of people to buy those products. And how does it know, you know, how many products are in the list? Well, we can use the React state object to uh, mirror the products that are actually, you know, contained in our smart contract on the blockchain. And I'll show you how to do that. So here's a real brief example. Um, here's, uh, you know, this.state equals this inside this constructor function. We're going to do something just like this uh, in a few minutes. And, and that's what how it manages this to-do list, right? How does it know how many items are on the to-do list? How can you add new ones, right? So item three, let's add it, right? How does it know how to do that? Well, it does that with the state object. So you'll see that in action here momentarily, all right? So all this, um, if I didn't mention already, this is JSX syntax, which allows us to write JavaScript inside these curly braces mixed in with HTML, right, inside this React code. So that's the templating language that we'll use. Um, so like I said, don't worry if you don't know React, if you haven't built an app in React yet, I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know. Um, if you have built an app in React, you should feel right at home, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, go to our project. Let's just change some code to make sure that, you know, we can see our changes reflected in our browser. I'm going to go ahead and change the name on this nav bar, right? So find this uh, nav uh, right here, and let's just change the name. So say DAP University's Blockchain Marketplace. You can call yours whatever you want to, but that's what I'm going to do. So we'll see. All right, boom, there you go. DAP University's Blockchain Marketplace. Notice I didn't even have to refresh the page. The server already does that for us. You can go here and uh, it already does that for us, all right? So I'll clear all this, all right? So now let's um, actually, next thing we want to do is wire up this component uh, to talk to the blockchain, all right? So Inside of here, you know, notice I can collapse this render function to see how simple this React component really is. Um, basically, you know, we just import React and component with inside JavaScript like this. All right, we got a logo inside of here. We got a CSS file, but basically, all the component is is just this class, right, that extends component, and it's got this render function. Right, this render function uh, just lays out all this HTML inside of here. Okay, so. We can wire up the component to talk to the blockchain with another function, all right? We're actually gonna use Web3.js to talk to the blockchain, and we're gonna create a new function inside of this component to uh, load Web3, okay? So we'll just call the function load Web3, load Web3, all right? And we will do it inside of here. So this is, we're gonna use the async await pattern just like we did in our tests. So I'll we'll call this async uh, load Web3. All right, so in order to do this, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, MetaMask has actually provided a way for you to connect your web apps to the blockchain with Web3.js. Okay, so if you go to this blog post, 
Um, this is floating around the web. You can just copy the tutorial example uh, in the description below to get this. But they actually suggest how you should do this, right? There's this code example here. So I'll just copy this and we'll go to our web app and we'll paste it in. All right, so don't worry if this looks giant and scary and you don't understand any of it, that's okay. I'll briefly explain what's happening here. So basically, you can detect um, MetaMask a few different ways, right? So for modern DAP browsers, there's a window.ethereum uh, property, right? And if that exists, you instantiate your connection like this, all right? For legacy DAP browsers, there's a window.web3 property, all right? And if that's the case, you instantiate your connection like this, all right? And if neither of those exists, you know that you don't have MetaMask installed and you want to, you know, do something about it. So they just console log. All right, so I actually want to adapt this code for our specific app. And you can find this in the uh, code examples for this section down in the description below. So I'm just gonna paste it in and explain it that way, all right. So, like I said, for modern DAP browsers, if window.ethereum exists, we're going to create a new connection to the blockchain uh, with Web3 like this. All right, so window.web3 is gonna equal new Web3, and then we're gonna pass in window.ethereum because we have it here, and we're gonna enable it. So uh, if that doesn't exist, we're going to look for window.web3 and we're going to instantiate a new connection uh, with the current provider, which we grab uh, from web3 like this, right? If neither of those exist, we're going to raise an alert that, hey, there's no MetaMask installed, you should install it, okay? So we also need to import web3 to make this work. Let's go to the top and just below React, we're going to import web3, right? We've already installed this inside of our package.json file here, right? So web3 is down here. And we can just import it like that. All right, so now let's actually, uh, let's, let's call this, right? We've defined it, but we haven't actually called it. So we're gonna create a new function uh, called component will mount. We're gonna run it async because we'll use the async await pattern. All right, so I didn't just make this name up. This is actually a function that comes with React component, right? Just like render. And this is a lifecycle method in React, which basically means uh, this is a function that gets run anytime this component uh, is getting created, right? And specifically, uh, when it's going to mount, this function is going to get called. There's several other lifecycle components, sorry, lifecycle functions for React components you can read about in the React documentation, but basically just know that this is what we want to do to load our Web3 connection. So say, await this.load Web3. All right. So save that, and we'll go to uh, our app here and see that nothing's broken. <laughs> so we can console log it. We could say uh, so log window.web3. All right, there we go. All right, so we've loaded a Web3 connection. Next, let's check the Web3 connection even more and um, actually fetch the account, right? So let's... Make sure that MetaMask works by seeing if we can retrieve this account address here and listing it out on the page. Okay, so we our next task. So we'll create a new function down here called async load blockchain data. And this is where we'll actually fetch information out of Web3 and get the account. So we'll start off by saying uh, const web3 equals window.web3. We're just gonna stash that here, right? Because we're attached to window at this point. And uh, let's get the account like this. So we'll say load account. It will say const accounts equals uh, web3, or await, web3 eth get accounts. So this is a function under the eth namespace for web3. All right, so what we'll do is console log accounts here. So what this does is, is returns all the accounts from our wallet. Our wallet in this case is MetaMask. And so um, it should just expose one account. All right, so we didn't actually call this. So we defined the function, we haven't called it yet. We'll do it like this, await this.load blockchain data. All right. All right, so we got an issue here. Web3 uh, get account is not defined. So this is plural, sorry guys. All right, boom, there we go. There's uh, our account, right? So A668, 
you go to Ganache, you'll see A668. Yep, that's the uh, seller account. Okay, that's what we expect. So now what we want to do is actually just get a single account, right? Accounts was an array. So we can get um, the first account like this, right? This is zero base index array. So what we want to do is actually store this inside of our component state. So remember I said that a minute ago uh, in React. Uh, let's see here. We've got a component state which we can use, right? We can set it up like this. We can create a default state with this constructor function. And we can, you know, set um, stuff in the state like this. So this dot state equals this. We can uh, set state, which I'll show you in a minute. Okay. So first, let's go ahead and create the uh, constructor, like React told us to. So uh, we'll say constructor. And we're going to pass in props. We'll say super props. So don't worry if you don't understand this just yet. Just bear with me. I will say this state equals uh, count. All right. So what we want to do is actually update this value. Okay. So let's do it like this. We'll say this dot set state. Right. This is a function that React already knows about inside the component, and we're gonna you know basically just pass in a JavaScript object with a key of account. All right, and we're going to read uh, out of the accounts and do it that way. All right, so this dot set state account, all right? And then we can actually access this value from state in our side of our component like this, right? Well, let's just uh, create a new place on the nav bar. Let's just uh, say, let's just do a paragraph tag for now. We'll format this more, but we'll actually list that like this. So we use these JSX um, brackets, right, to put JavaScript inside of here. We'll say this.state.account. All right, so let's go refresh the page. It's going to look ugly, probably, but let's just see if it worked. All right, you can actually see it. Boom, there it is. It's kind of dark, uh, but it's listed out on the page. All right, awesome. So I want to clean this up a little bit. Instead of just putting this in a yucky paragraph uh, tag here, Let's actually um, put it inside of a uh, UL that Bootstrap knows about. All right, so here's a better formatting. So this is something that Bootstrap um, gives us by default. If you go check their nav bar examples, it'll show you how to do this. Uh, or you can just copy this code out of the code examples. Okay. So uh, I did this data count, but I put it inside of here. It's going to look nicer. All right. There you go. So that looks a lot better. We have a nice legible uh, account here. It's sort of like seeing your username at the top of a web application. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is actually update this, this constructor here. Um, we had, you know, a default account. We're going to add some more values here. So I'm going to fill these in just for the future. All right, so whenever we load stuff from the blockchain, we're going to get the product count, right? And it's going to be zero by default if there's no products. Um, also, if there's no products, the products are going to be an empty array, all right? And by default, we want the app to be loading. So we're going to update all these values later, but I'm going to go ahead and just set this default state for now so we don't have to keep going back and changing it. So this is get jumping ahead a little bit, but I would recommend just going and filling this out so that we can get confused later, okay? All right, so next thing I want to do is actually load the smart contract from the blockchain. We've got the account. Now we want to get uh, the smart contract. So we need two pieces of information. We need the smart contract, ABI, and we need the address. So what do I mean by that? If you go to this marketplace.json file here, you'll see the ABI, right? This is the abstract binary interface. This basically just describes, you know, the functions of the smart contract, what it does, all that kind of stuff. And then the address, which is down here. Uh, I'm going to minimize a bunch of this stuff. All right, address is here. Boom. So here's the ABI, here's the address. So we can actually read this JSON file in our React component to fetch this ABI out. We can also fetch this address. We have to get into this uh, networks uh, key here. So what this file does is it manages where the smart contract is on multiple networks. This could be on the main net. It could be on a test network. Um, but here it's on Ganache, which is uh, network ID 5777 and we can dig in to this to find the address of the smart contract deployed to Ganache, right? And Web3 needs both of those pieces of information in order to fetch the smart contract and actually use it, you know, the ABI and the address. So let's actually get both of those things. 
the first thing we want to do is import um, the marketplace like this. All right, that just gets the marketplace file, goes up a directory and then looks down into ABIs and fetches marketplace.json. All right, and then we're going to actually uh, get the marketplace like this. Uh, let's just go to load blockchain data and we can, you know, say like marketplace ABI. So let's just console log that. Save that and go back to our app. All right, so here's the ABI. We can see the information about it. Boom, that's working. So now we need to get the address. Um, so we can say uh, console log ABI and say console log uh, marketplace, marketplace uh, dot uh, networks. And we can say 57 and then address. All right. So boom, there you go. There's the address of the smart contract. So we need both those pieces of information in order to, uh, you know, instantiate the smart contract. So what we could do is create the new smart contract like this. We could basically say um, const marketplace equals web three dot eth uh, marketplace or sorry contract capital C. Passing the ABI. So marketplace. We'll say ABI and address. So say const ABI, const address, say this, all right? And then we'll console log Oh, see here, all right, boom, there we go. So there's our actual smart contract. So that's how we load it from the blockchain. All right. So that's a, a quick uh, way to load the smart contract from the blockchain, but let's, this is too brittle, right? We don't want to hard code the network because yours might be different than mine. If we deploy this to a test network, it might change, all right? So what we want to do is actually detect the network dynamically. So I'm going to do this. It's a const network ID. It goes web3 eth, um, it's called get, oh, sorry, web3eth.net get ID. And we want to use await here. All right, so I could also just pass in this network ID like this. Boom, right, let's try it again. All right, so it still worked. Uh, we're not console logging marketplace, but that's okay. Uh, we can console log the network ID just to be sure. Should be 5777. All right, boom, there we go. All right, so that's working just fine. So this is also brittle because if we're on a different network, then this would potentially be, uh, you know, it would be empty and we wouldn't have address available here. So what I want to do is basically uh, do this, move this out and say um, const contract data equals marketplace networks, or I say network data. All right. And then we'll say if network data, if not, let's do something else here. Sorry guys. Okay, so let's move some of this code inside of here. So let's, I don't need to do this quite so much. And then we'll say network data. All right. So that's how we're going to log this out, All right? So we can say console log uh, marketplace. All right, so now let's see if this works. I might have made a mistake, but no, nope, worked just fine. Awesome. So what I want to do, um, so see if that makes sense. Like you can pause the video if you want to and look at this. So basically, you know, we want to just make sure that the contract is actually deployed to the network. Because look what happens if it's not, right? If I just, if I just took this out and saved this like this and didn't put this inside of an if else, if we go to like the main net uh, or something like that, let's go to main net, uh, let's refresh the page, then like boom, our app's going to blow up, okay? 
So we can fix this problem. Let's uh, put this back inside of here. All right. So if network data, uh, else what we want to do is alert the user that the contract's not deployed to the network. All right, just like this, boom. Window.alert, marketplace contract not deployed to detected network. So save that, refresh the page, still on mainnet, and then boom, there you go. Marketplace contract not deployed to detected network. Now, if you click OK, your app's probably, yeah, it works just fine. Um, but now if we go back to Ganache and then refresh the page, boom, works just fine, all right? And then we can actually, you know, console log marketplace here. All right, boom, awesome. So we've uh, actually talked to the smart contract and wired it up inside this application. All right, so that's pretty good progress for today, guys. We have, you know, loaded the account from the blockchain. We've also loaded the smart contract. You know, really quickly before we go, uh, let's clean things up just a little bit. What I want to do is actually move this nav bar into its own component here. All right, so what I'm going to do is copy this, uh, create a new file here. Oops. And then I'm going to say uh, navbar.js. All right, I'm going to paste all this code inside of here. Uh, I'm just going to start deleting things. So take out all this. Basically, we just want uh, the React component stuff. We don't want any of this. All right. I'm going to take the nav bar and uh, minimize it so that we can copy this information. Let's go ahead and bump this over. All right. So copy this out. Take out all this junk from the return function. All right, so this is what we want. Basically, we're going to turn this into navbar. And I'm going to put the navbar code back in here. All right, so what I want to do is basically just like clean this up to have multiple components. We don't see all this code on the page at one time. We're going to keep adding to this as we keep building out our marketplace. And I want to, you know, uh, show you how React components work and uh, how you can, you know, use them as, you know, modules, essentially. So inside of here, we need to fix this. Um, we don't know about this dot state account anymore because we haven't assigned uh, the account to this component state. But React allows us to pass uh, variables down to subcomponents with this props right here, right? So that's what I was talking about inside this constructor. You see props. So we can uh, delete this nav, right? And then uh, render this nav inside of here and then pass the variables down, right? So the first thing we want to do is uh, take the nav bar, import it like this, and we want to put it here. We do this with uh, JSX, so it looks kind of like HTML, nav bar. And then we can pass the account down like this. Account equals this dot state dot account. Right, because that's what we saw in our, our previous example. And then we can go to the navbar component and say this.props.account. All right, so if I did everything correctly, this should just work. Uh, it looks, the app should look just like it did because it's simply refactoring. All right, looks like it still works. Awesome. So that's all I got for today, guys. Again, you can check out the code example uh, for this section down below. Now I want to pick up where we left off in the last video, right? So the last video, we basically, you know, fetched our account from the blockchain and uh, showed it on the page. And we also, you know, fetched our smart contract, the marketplace smart contract, and logged out of the console here. Okay, so that's two big things. Um, so what I want to do now is actually store the uh, marketplace inside the state. So we'll say uh, const, well, actually this, we'll say this.set state. And we'll say marketplace and uh, equal to marketplace. But in JavaScript, we can do this shorthand like this, boom. And what I also want to do is uh, update loading. So for now, um, loading is always true. We can't really tell in our app yet. You'll see that more later. But what I'm going to do is say this set state. Loading equals false. Okay. So by default, it's true, and now it's false. We don't see any consequence of that yet, but whenever we are um, 
basically showing the blockchain data once we start actually adding code here we're going to like show a loader and we'll show the loader if loading is set to true and if not we'll set it to false okay that's what this does this and then this okay so now let's actually uh clear out some of this we don't want to show all this boilerplate code down here uh we have the nav bar but we want to actually create some content inside of here let's clear that out go back to our browser and check all right now it's empty that's what we want so let's uh go ahead and sketch out some html we will uh, use a div here. We'll say div, div uh, id equals content. We'll say main, actually, main. And we'll do this. And let's do an h1 tag. What we're going to do is actually create a place to add a product. That's what we'll do in this video. We'll say add product. That'd be the first kind of thing that they can do inside the marketplace. So we'll save this. All right, so it didn't even work yet. I don't know why. Oh, I see. It's because essentially it's hidden. It's underneath the nav bar. So we need to create some extra, some extra stuff here inside of Bootstrap. Okay, so we're going to wrap this. Let's call this content. Like I said originally, I'm going to add some code here. All right, so this is going to be what we'll see. And then we're going to also close this out like this. So you could pause the video really fast if you want to just see this. All right. So let's go back to the page. And there we go. Awesome. So add product. It was there before. It was just hidden up inside of here. So Bootstrap relies upon, you know, this object, this idea of containers, uh, rows, uh, this grid system with, you know, column, large, stuff like that. Okay. So I've created a lot of this for you, so you don't have to think about it. Um, but it's going to make it look nice on the page. And here's where we're going to add our product. Okay. And now just like we refactored this nav bar, I want to refactor this entire section where we're going to add all of our app code, uh, you know, to, to show all this stuff on the page. I want to put it in a subcomponent as well. So we're going to create a new one. Uh, we call this main, main.js, capital M. All right, so let's actually just copy what we did with the nav bar. Go over to main, paste it in. Instead of nav bar, we'll call it main. All right, say M-A-I-N. And let's take out all the code. And let's just paste in what we did here. All right, so uh, just this part. Copy that. Main.js, we'll do this. All right, add product. And we'll save this. So we will import main just like we did nav bar. Nav bar, and then main, main, and then we'll put main here, main, go back to our browser, and it still works, awesome. So now what we can do is, I want to hide content on the page if the app is loading, and I just mentioned that a minute ago, right, we, we set loading state to false here, and it's true by default. So basically, whenever load blockchain data is done, we want to say, hey, our app is loaded, show all the content on the page. And we want to show a loader if it's still loading, okay? So we'll do that like this. We're going to use a uh, ternary operator in JavaScript. We'll basically just say, uh, we'll use curly braces to run JavaScript inside of here. We'll say this.state, right, dot loading, right? We're keeping track of loading inside of this state object. And we'll say question mark. Uh, if it's uh, if it is, we'll show a loader. If not, we will show this component right here. All right, we could just say uh, we we could do this. We could we could say like you know I'm gonna I'm basically gonna create this right here. All right, so I'm gonna put a boom a div that works as a loader. All right. So let's go back to our app and refresh. All right, so you can see that happen. There's a loader, boom, and then it works. I'll do it one more time. All right, you see it? So that's how that works. So now I want to refactor this so that it looks a little nicer. Basically, I'm going to you know put some space here, and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this on the same column as this. All right, and then I'm going to do it just like that. All right, so that's a way you can use a multi-line ternary in JavaScript to do that. So basically, a ternary is just like an if 
then statement. So if this, then this, else do this. Okay, just like uh, this. If this, then this. All right. So I'll save that and go back. Still works. Awesome. So now we have this main component uh, that we can use, and we'll pass values down to this later. But now we don't have to worry about uh, cluttering up this view. This is mostly responsible for loading up the blockchain data and stuff like that. And then this is where we'll actually interact with the, uh, the, the template code. All right, so now what I want to do is just get started with some basic templates that we're going to add to uh, inside of here. All right, so what we want to do is show a form to add a product, and then we're going to show a table to list out all the products on the page. Okay, so I'm just going to paste in some template code that we're going to wire up step by step. So this part isn't super important. Like I don't necessarily need to teach you how to write HTML in this tutorial. I mostly want to show you how to work with the blockchain. So I'm going to paste this in, all right? And you can get this in the code example down below. There's nothing special about this. This is just HTML code. We're going to change all this later, but this is just going to give you some placeholder code to see uh, what we're going to actually create, okay? So here you go. Here's a form to add the product. I'll have a name, a price. You can, you know, submit it, and it'll add the product on the blockchain. It's not going to do it yet. We actually have to create the functionality for that. And then here's where we're going to list out all the products that people can buy. It'll show who owns it. Um, it'll show the price, the name of the product, and the ID, okay? And this isn't really on the blockchain right now. It's just placeholder code. We're going to modify all this. Like these buttons don't work or anything, right? We're going to wire all this up in this video and also the next video. But in this video, we're going to concentrate on making this form work so we can actually list products on the blockchain as the, uh, the seller, right? And the next video, we're going to change it to the buyer and try to buy the products that the seller has listed, okay? So let's do that. The first thing we want to do is actually wire up this form. So right now, the form is pretty bare. It doesn't really do anything. We just see a form here with some fields. But what we want to do is whenever the form is submitted is, you know, tell the blockchain to add the product that we entered here, okay? And in order to do that, we need a function, on the smart, we need to call the function on the smart contract that we created in the previous tutorials, uh, the add product function, right? So let's go ahead and do that, all right? So we're going to create a new function inside of React here, inside of our component, just below constructor. We'll call this uh, create product. And we'll pass in the name, price, this is just like uh, the name of the price and the solidity function that we created in the previous tutorials. So the first thing that we'll do is tell uh, React that we're going to be loading this state. Anytime we want to interact with the blockchain, we're going to tell React that we're loading. All right. And we can... Um, we, can we can create the product like this. We'll say this.state.marketplace. All right, that reads the smart contract out of state that we stored here. This is the deployed smart contract, the Web3 contract. Say methods, all right, that exposes the functions on the smart contract. Say create product. I'm oh, sorry. And we'll say the name, price, pass those in. All right. And... It, that's not enough just to call the function, right? What we actually have to do is say send and pass in the metadata. So who's it from? From this.state.account. And also, um, yeah, that's actually enough. So there we go. Boom. So then what we're going to do is say uh, once. So it's basically going to have a use a promise here. So once receipt pass in receipt this is the transaction receipt that comes back from the uh, blockchain this state lo loading oh sorry this sorry set state loading false okay 
So that's how we're going to create the product. This is a function that we'll use. All right, so now what we want to do is actually call this function down inside of this component whenever the form is submitted. Okay, so we need to do a couple of things. We actually need to pass the function down. We're going to do it with props, just like we did with the nav bar. See, we passed the account down with props here. We can also pass functions down with props. So we'll do that like this. We'll say create product equals this dot create product. All right. I'm actually going to, yeah, I'll just leave that that way for now. So in order for React to know what this dot create product is, we need to bind it to the component. All right, this is a really critical step. It's a, it's a gotcha. <laughs> if you, uh, yeah, it's easy to forget to do this. So don't worry if you fail. Uh, I've done this many times before. So... You got to do this dot create product equals this dot create product bind this. All right, and that's how you let React know that this create product is the same thing as this. All right. So we're gonna pass that down to our main uh, component with uh, that, and now we can actually call this function inside of here. So we'll go to the code and. We'll basically call that function anytime this form is submitted. So what's really nice is React allows us to have an, a run on submit handlers uh, inside our component really easily like this, say on submit. And we'll say event. All right. And so we can just break this up like this to execute our code inside of here. And we can actually call um, this dot props dot create product inside of here. All right, we just need to pass in a name and a price, just like the function expects here. All right, so a name and a price. So that's all we really have to do is basically just say on submit uh, call create product. So now the next steps are to fetch the name from this field and the price from this field. So how do we do that in React? Well, uh, React manages the values of these forms with something called refs, okay? And we can assign the refs like this. So after text, we'll say ref, um, we'll say, we'll assign it like this, say input. I'll say this.product name equals input. All right. And the same thing for here, uh, we can say this dot product price equals input, all right? So whenever we fill those out, React is gonna use this ref inside this component, and we can access that inside of here like this. We'll say const name equals uh, this dot product name, all right? but we want to call value because it's a form field. All right. And we can do the same thing for the price. This dot product. All right. And then we can say uh, value. Okay. So then we can just pass in the product price like this. So we've got the name, we've got the price. Anytime this form is submitted, we can uh, call that function. But there's one more thing we have to do, all right? We, uh, this price and this thing, we're going to allow people to store it in Ether, right? So 10 Ether, 1 Ether, something like that. We want to store that value in way. Because remember, anytime we use our Solidity smart contracts and we transfer Ether around, it's always done in way, right? So we can convert it to way like this. So say uh, window.web3.utils to way. This will look very familiar from the tests. Uh, this dot product price dot value to string. All right, it's important that you call to string there and say ether. All right, so there you go. There's your price in uh, way. All right, so you got the name and the price. So I think that we've done everything. Let's just go ahead and try it out. If we haven't done everything, <laughs> then uh, trust me, our app's going to tell us. So we'll go back here and we'll say, uh, you know, iPhone 
let's just say, let's just do this, do Rolex Submariner. And for the price, we'll say 30 ETH. All right, so add product. All right, so I didn't like something. Let's figure out what it was. All right, so I think I know what's going on here. Um, so first, I forgot to do this. So say event, prevent default. All right, go back to the page here. Let's try to add a product again. Say my product one ETH, add product. And boom, there we go. We see an error. So this dot state dot loading is not a function. So that was just a dumb mistake that I made, guys. Sorry about that. Um, so this should be this uh, set state. Yeah, so hopefully that'll work. Let's try it again. Let's do Rolex Submariner. Let's say 30 ETH, add product. And boom, we see a MetaMask confirmation come up. All right, awesome. So this is a good sign. Let's uh, click confirm. All right, let's sell it. And there we go. I saw a MetaMask confirmation come up. It came off uh, off screen for me on my second monitor, uh, but I'll refresh the page and show you that, yeah, we're all good. So let's just prove that it worked. Let's go to main.js, or sorry, app.js, and let's actually get the product count. It should be one, all right? So, you know, we, uh, we could do that like this. So just say const product count equals await marketplace methods product count, right? Just like we did methods create product, we can do product count methods product count count and say call right so call, there's you can do call methods in web3 or send methods right these send transactions these just read data right so a call method is what we want the console.log product count it should just be one because we've only created one product so far all right boom there we go we could say product count to string or to number just depends on what you want to see Boom, there we go, awesome. All right guys, so that's it for this video. We have successfully created a product on the blockchain uh, with this client-side application with React.js and Web3 uh, for our decentralized marketplace. All right, so you can check out the code examples and the link down below. All right everybody, let's finish off this client-side application. See, on the last video, we added the ability to create a product on the blockchain, right? We've got one product so far. We've logged that to the console. Now, in this video, we want to wire up this table. We want to list out all the products in the marketplace right here, and we want uh, the buyer to be able to buy them with these buttons, okay? And this address is going to change to reflect uh, their actual address, okay? So, we'll do it like this. Let's go here and uh, do a couple things. First, we wanna list out all the products from the blockchain. We'll go to our app.js component, and just below you know, this line where we log the product count, we're actually gonna fetch each product individually from the blockchain. So remember, we stored our uh, products inside of a mapping, so I'll show you that. Uh, let's see here, marketplace.soul. Remember, we had this uh, products mapping, and we kept a products count. Now we want to do is take each number in the mapping. So let's say product count is you know, five. That means we have five products. We basically want to take product one, two, three, four, five and fetch each one out individually here, right? So we, we have to do it that way in Solidity because there's no way to know the size of this mapping. Uh, we can't just say like mapping.length or something like that. Uh, you can't iterate over this mapping. So you have to like keep a counter cache and fetch each one individually, right? You could do other things, but that's what we're going to do in this tutorial. Okay. So we're just going to create a loop to do that. Uh, well, first, let's, uh, let's store the product count. All right. This set state product count, just like we did marketplace. And let's loop through the products and load them. Uh, onto this React component. So we'll do it like this. Boom. Right, let me explain this. So basically I'm just saying uh, for, you know, one all the way up to the product count, right? So however many products there are, we want to uh, add products like this. So we'll just say const product equals await product methods products. We're going to read it out of this mapping, you know, products right here. Pass in the index to fetch that individual product. 
say call just like you did with product account because we don't have to send any ether we just read the data and then we're going to fetch this product and we're going to add it to this products array here right inside of the component state right which are products and we're using the ES6 spread operator. Basically, we just take the existing products and add an extra product to this array and return an entirely new array uh, to this product's uh, key in the component state, okay? All right, so that's how we load up this. And let's uh, console all the products here, console.log, uh, this state products back to our app and boom there we go we can see it so we can see a rolex submariner was listed there and we can see yeah all the data about it boom there we go the price all that kind of stuff awesome so we've successfully fetched all of our existing products in the blockchain we can certainly add more uh, but let's list those out on the page we can pass them down to the main component uh, like this, we'll just copy out this state products, take out the console log, like this. So uh, main, we can say products like this. Uh, let's just make sure we call it the right thing. We'll say products. Say this dot state products. And while we're here, I'm gonna format this a little bit. Say main, uh, add a new line. So we're gonna keep adding to this list. I want it to be maintainable. All right, so products, and then create product as a function. So now inside this um, main.js file, we can actually list the products out on the page. So let's look at how to do that. So inside this main.js file, uh, we see the table here, right? It's got a header and a body, and we want to use this, basically this table row as a template for the product. Okay, so we're going to take out all this, and we're going to use this as a pr single product template. So we're going to loop through all the products like this. We're going to you know, use these curly braces and say this.props.products, right? Because we passed in uh, products with props. Say map, right? And then we'll say uh, product. We're also going to say key, right? And then we'll pass this a function. And inside of here, Let's uh, actually return. Oops. And for now, we'll simply just say, let's we'll just put this in here. All right, now if we don't do something very particular here, React is gonna yell at us. We have to assign each uh, table row that we render out a key so that it's unique in React. All right, so a key from here is just going to go here. That basically lets us know how many are on the page. So let me explain what's going on here. We loop through all the products, and for every product that exists, we're just going to put a table row on the existing table. And right now, it's just got these default values, right? You know, just one iPhone. We, we need to actually wire this up, but for now, let's just check it to see if it works. All right. There we go. iPhone X, one ETH, all right? So now it's actually fill in the values from the product itself. So here I'll say the product product ID to string. All right. And then here we'll say product name. All right. And then here let's actually list out the price. Say product price. And then here we'll say product owner, all right? Boom. So let's look at that. All right, we've got an issue here. Let's see here. Oh, found keys with hex. All right, so there's a few things. I think it's from the owner maybe. Oh no, hold on. Let's try this. Do string. All right, let's try this. Okay, awesome. So here we go. We saw the product that we added in the previous video, this Rolex Submariner ID1. The price is supposed to be three ether, but it looks like it's expressed in way. Remember, that's just the, the the ether's penny, basically. But here's the owner, and the buy button doesn't work yet. That's okay. We'll, we'll fill that in in a minute. So let's convert the price to be for real. We'll say window, 
Web3 uh, utils from way. And then we'll say our product price to string and we'll say ether. Close that. All right. All right. Still got a problem here. Can't read property from way. Oh, sorry. Web3. Uh, Window.web3. Sorry, I misspelled this. Utils. All right. So that's better. But now let's actually add ETH to this. All right. Boom. There we go. 30 ETH. Rolex Submariner. Here's the owner. Click buy. Okay. Awesome. So that lists all the products out on the page. All right, now let's actually create the ability to purchase a product. All right, and that's gonna need some more functionality, kind of like we did whenever we bought the product. All right, so let's go up to uh, our app.js file. Let's create a new function, just like we had, you know, create product. Let's do purchase product. Uh, let's see here, call it purchase product. And in here, we wanna do the ID and the price, okay. So we'll say this dot set state loading is true, but this state marketplace methods say purchase product. And we'll pass in uh, the ID. And we'll say send, so from. But since we're buying it, remember in our tests, uh, we created we had to send in the ether with the transaction. So inside the function metadata, we actually need to send in that specific amount of ether. So say value equals uh, price. All right. And then same thing, I would just say, you know, once receipt, set state, loading false. Okay. All right. So just like uh, the last one, we have to update this. We have to bind it. So this create product, we'll say purchase product. And down here, create product, we'll say this, uh, no, purchase product. Oops, sorry. Looks like I had a uh, error here. I don't want to delete that. So we'll do, it, we'll do it above it. Do like this, sorry guys. Purchase product. Boom, awesome. So now this function should be available in the uh, subcomponent, right? So now inside of main, uh, we're going to wire up the purchasing function. Okay, so basically what we're gonna do is use this button, all right? So inside this button, what we're gonna do is say, hmm, we're gonna use an on-click handler. So up here we did on submit and called the function inside the form. But down here, we're going to use on click. So we'll say on click. And then we'll uh, let's see here, use some curly braces and say event. And we're going to, you know, execute the code inside of here. But this is going to get really ugly really fast. So let's go ahead and break this up. Uh, we don't need this class name by button really. Uh, but let's do break this up because this will get pretty ugly pretty fast. So let's move the button down here. And then let's, uh, let's do this. All right. Actually, let's do that. Say bye. Sorry, sometimes it's hard to tell. All right. So now we can fill in this on click like this. Okay, boom, awesome. So just say console log clicked. Just make sure it's working. All right, so it's clicked. That works. So let's call the function inside of here. So we want to do is say uh, this dot props dot purchase product. We need to pass in the um, ID, and we need to also pass in the uh, it's the price, okay? So what we're gonna do is just add those uh, to the button like this. We'll just say name, the button name will be the product ID. All right, that's what we get from here. And then we'll say that the value of this button is going to be the product price. 
Okay. So we'll say this dot props dot purchase product. We'll say uh, event target name and then event target value. Boom. All right, that should work, guys. Let's give it a try. So let's go to the buyer instead of the seller. All right. Sorry, I changed the account here. Let's say buyer. All right. Let's try to buy it. So let's refresh the page just to be sure. Click buy. All right, see our MetaMask confirmation pop up for our Rolex Submariner. It's 30 ETH. It's pretty expensive, but we're going to do it. Click confirm. And boom, there we go. I just got a confirmation. So refresh the page and boom, there we can see our address, right? Not the seller's address. It's transferred ownership to us. <laughs> now we own the Rolex, all right? Very cool. So um, let's do one more thing inside of our project. Let's hide this button. We don't want we don't want anyone to try to buy it again. So if it has already been purchased, uh, then we want to basically prevent that again. All right. So let's just do it like this. I'm just gonna do this. Boom. So I'll do this. We'll say. Uh, bang product purchased so basically if it's not purchased then show the button all right and if it has been purchased just return null all right so this needs to be formatted over a little bit but yeah I like that awesome doesn't look awesome but <laughs> all right so there we go Awesome. So yeah, the button is gone. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to the buyer account and the seller account. Let's do seller just to be consistent. Uh, we'll say seller. So his balance should have gone up. <laughs> let's say, um, you know, AirPods. Let's say they're, you know, one ETH. Add product. See our MetaMask confirmation come up. Boom. All right, and then let's buy it from the buyer's perspective again. And we can watch the ownership change. So here's the seller. Click buy. MetaMask comes up. Click buy. Refresh the page. And boom, we own it. Awesome, and the button's gone. All right, guys, so that's it that is a complete decentralized blockchain application powered by smart contracts you've done the entire thing you've created the client side application you've got it wired up you can add products you can buy products you can transfer the ownership instantly just like a vending machine so congratulations on making it through that concludes the client side portion of this application all right so we have one last task to do, and that's we're going to deploy the smart contract to a test network. We're going to get the uh, you know, uh, code off our machine and actually deploy it so we're not running ganache. All right, now in this video, what we want to do is take the smart contracts and actually put them on a real blockchain, right? Up until now, we've been you know, running everything on ganache, just this test blockchain. But we want to put it out in the real world to see how it works. Okay, so... Um, you can see a list of blockchain networks here inside MetaMask, right? So the Ethereum mainnet is, you know, where real Ether wor is worth, you know, real money. Um, but these other networks are just test networks. They allow you to, like, play around with your application on a test network. So you're not, like, risking real funds or anything like that. So we're going to use the Kovan test network, okay? So I'm going to click over to Kovan. And, uh, you know, I'm going to use, uh, you know, my accounts in Ganache here, which currently have no Ether. Um, and we see nothing inside our application, right? Because the smart contract isn't actually deployed to the Kovan test network. So that's what we want to do is actually get it out there. Uh, we're going to need a couple different things in order to do that. Okay, so here's, you know, Kovan on Etherscan. You go to kovan.etherscan.io to explore this and learn more about Kovan test network. But we need a couple things. First, we need to be able to uh, connect to the Kovan test network. And we're going to use Infura for that. So Infura is going to give us access to an Ethereum node, right? So an Ethereum node is how we connect to the actual blockchain. Um, and Infura gives you 
an Ethereum node as a service, and you can get started for free by just going and creating an account and logging in. And once you do, you'll see your dashboard. You'll see an option to create uh, a project. And once you do, you'll see some details like this. All right. So uh, after you've created the project, you're going to need uh, this endpoint right here. This is basically the URL for the Ethereum node. So I'm going to go down to Kovan and see this, you know, kovan.inferior.io forward slash v3. I'm going to copy this, okay? And you keep this uh, for later use, okay? So this is our Ethereum node that we're going to use to deploy the smart contracts and use our DAP uh, on the Kovan test network, okay? So keep that handy. The next thing we need is some actual uh, Ether because if you go here, you know, we don't have any ether to deploy our smart contract with it's you know it's zero so let's go to ganache and uh, copy this private key first of all and we'll just uh, copy it like this and let's uh, add it to metamask I'm going to import it like this uh, sorry import account and paste in the private key again don't don't use this account for real on the main net um, so now what we want to do is actually request some ether for that. Okay, so we can go to the Kovan test network faucet. So a faucet is basically just uh, a website or a smart contract essentially that uh, dispenses ether. So I can uh, just paste in my address. So I'll paste in the address right here, copy it. Paste it in here and he will, uh, this person, Scott Bigelow, inside this chat room will actually send me some. It's a bot, but he's the administrator and he will uh, let me know as soon as it has have some ether in that account. All right, so it just said it was successful. So let's go over here and uh, let's refresh this. This is the transaction on the Kovan test network that he told me about. All right, boom, there we go. So he sent, said three ether was sent. Let's see if we can see our balance in MetaMask. Go back here and there we go. Awesome, we have three ether in our wallet. And let's rename this. Um, this is the account, let's do it like this. We'll call this the deployer. So details, edit, deployer. So just so we know what this account's for. This account's used to deploy the smart contracts, okay? All right, so we got three ether, um, and we can deploy the smart contract with this particular account. All right, so now I'm gonna show you how to deploy this smart contract really easily. All right, so head on over to remix.ethereum.org, all right? So this is a Solidity IDE in your browser, so it allows you to you know edit smart contracts and things like that, but also compile them, run them, deploy them all from your browser, right? It's nice and easy. So what you're gonna do is go to um, your project, find the marketplace smart contract that we created, uh, copy it, all right? Then go back to Remix and uh, create a new file. So you go to this plus icon here, and then we'll call this Marketplace, capital M, Marketplace, dot soul, all right? And we'll paste the code inside of here, all right? So let's check the Solidity version. Um, so we want version 0.5.0, and you can also go to the ABI to see what was compiled with uh, in development. So if you go to uh, marketplace.json, look for compiler, all right, and this will show you the version. So it's compiled with this, uh, version 0.5.0, this commit hash. So let's go here, 0.5.0. All right, this is it right here. 55A. Yeah, 55A. All right, so close enough. All right, so let's uh, to compile. All good. Now let's run it. Okay, so we're going to check uh, Injected Web 3. And what we're going to do is select uh, the Kovan test network that we got our test ether from. Okay, so head there, Kovan. It's going to reload the page. That's fine. Okay, so they're going to have a new version of Remix. That's what this is saying. <laughs> All right, so we're on the Kovan test network. We can still see our smart contract. Let's uh, deploy it. Click deploy. You have to sign this with MetaMask. All right, so what I'm going to do is change these values. I'm going to edit these to make this happen pretty fast. We'll do 30 seconds. Let's actually just do advanced. So I'm going to do uh, 50 GUE to make this really fast. And the gas limit, I'm going to say... Uh, Let's do a million units of gas. One, zero, 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 zero. All right, so the new potential total will be 0 0.05 ETH, which is fine, for, especially for a test network. Save this, confirm, and it's pending. 
So I'm going to wait for this to finish. We can check out the transaction on Etherscan. This is covon.etherscan.io. This will show us uh, if this worked on the test network, and it worked. Okay, cool. So now let's uh, copy this value. So let's, uh, let's see here. This is the contract address. We'll save that here for just one second. And let's go back to our code. Now, you can deploy this smart contract with Truffle, uh, but I just showed you how to do it with Remix. So let's create a new network right here. Normally, Truffle will do this for you. I'm going to do it manually since we deployed with Remix. Um, I've been having some trouble with Truffle lately getting contracts on the test network. Uh, so let's just do what works for now. So I'm going to change this to network uh, 42. That's the network ID for the Kovan test network, okay? So just trust me on that. If you want to look up the different network IDs uh, for the different Ethereum networks, um, you can certainly do that, but that's what Kovan is. So let's uh, copy in the address. Go find this information here, contract created. Uh, let's see here. Let's copy this. Uh, let's see, all right. Address, and then let's do the transaction hash. We'll just copy this. And click that. Okay, cool. Now we can verify that this exists in the Kovan test network by saying truffle networks. And it should show us the address on the Kovan test network as well as Ganache. Okay, so here, uh, here we go. Network ID marketplace for this. Okay, awesome. And network ID 42 is, is Kovan, all right. So let's uh, save that and go back to Remix and, or sorry, the app, and let's change the Kovan test network, and we should be able to interact with the, uh, yeah, we should be able to interact with the smart contract now. So let's refresh the page. Now, let's see, it doesn't yell at us. It doesn't say that the contract was not deployed to the network. You know, if we went to mainnet, it'll tell us that. All right, so let's reload it. Uh, I'll click that remix so we get the, stop getting those errors. But see, here, it says marketplace is not, uh, been deployed to the network when we switch to mainnet, but we don't get that error whenever we, uh, you know, go to Kovan. So that's a good start. Let's try to add a product. Let's just say Apple AirPods. And let's, um, let's do a price. We'll just say one Ether. Okay, add product. We'll get the MetaMask confirmation to pop up. Let's confirm the transaction. Let's edit the gas just to make it fast. Edit. We'll do fast. 30 seconds. Okay. Confirm, and let's wait and see if it finishes. All right, it worked. I just got the transaction confirmation on Etherscan uh, from MetaMask. So I refreshed the page in order to see their product. You might have to do that as well. Um, but there you go. So your smart contract is deployed to a real blockchain. So it's not running on Ganache anymore. It's actually running on a public blockchain network. Now, granted, this is a test network, right? Uh, so the, the Ether on here isn't worth real money, but, but still you see that your smart contract actually works on a public blockchain, and that's really important. All right, guys, so congratulations. You have come to the end of this tutorial series where I showed you how to build a full stack DAP uh, from scratch, right? So congratulations, you know, you guys have stuck it out, done the hard work, and you're on your way to becoming a real world blockchain developer, all right? So again, if you wanna find all the code to this, check the link out down in the description below. You can find a full length article on my website with the link down below as well, so you can get the written instructions if you need more clarification about anything. And you know, as always, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and click the like button down below. And if you wanna learn how to become a highly paid blockchain developer, you need to join my free training on my website over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. All right, until next time, guys, thanks for watching Dapp University.